we are live. Welcome to 99 Film, Star Wars Episode 1 Review and Thoughts, The Phantom Menace. A long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, God is dead, Jar Jar Binks killed him. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to spend forever on that. I will only dedicate a very brief portion of this video to criticizing Jar Jar Binks in the character section. I'm going to give the movie a fair chance, in general, the prequels, giving them a fair chance. There are several things that I do love about the prequels, or want to love at least. And no, as others have stated, this is definitely far from the worst movie ever made. It is probably one of the single most disappointing movies ever made. It is a time of great uncertainty in the galaxy. Star Wars fans and somehow a number of reviewers, when this first came out, insist that this is a satisfying Star Wars movie. And bafflingly, in recent years, the prequel trilogy has been reassessed and a number of people are now claiming that they're masterpieces. Yes, I am aware it is Halloween. No, I'm not reviewing a horror movie, though I am reviewing a horrible movie. And in my defense, the last two weeks I reviewed horror movies. And if you don't think Venom 2 is a horror movie, you have not seen it. I almost definitely will not be making any more religious references, except possibly discussing the Force. I just thought it was a funny way to open the video. And yeah, I realized it was like a minute and a half ago by now. But yes, I did start this video by saying the year and the fact that it's a film. Because you know that I am not above reviewing one of the video games. the You know, the tie-in video games to this. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the review, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. To see its length, check the time codes in the description box. I'm currently dealing with some back pain, but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I'm going to speak faster until my back feels better. I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. Also, please note, I will not warn before spoilers for episodes 4 through 6. Only the movies that had been released when this was released. Not the things that were released later, but set earlier than this, or episodes 4 through 6. And, yeah, as, as stated before, I believe you should watch these in the order they were released, not in the cr chronological order of the events they depict. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for this movie, as well as still for, you know, episodes 4 through 6. I will not be spoiling episodes 2, 3, or 7 through 9, or the spin-off movies. And that's enough about the spoilers but but yeah i will be discussing the endings so, you know once i get into the thoughts section so it is beware there are be spoilers when i get there and let's see yeah so that this review isn't purely for my own sake i've tried to collect as much information as i could on as many different aspects that i've heard over many years from many different sources now so yeah there are several major appeals of comic books adaptations of them and stuff heavily inspired by them which i would say there's a lot of stuff in the star wars franchise heavily inspired by comic books one of them is that they can have many wild concepts and have them play off each other magic versus magic powers versus robots for example Outside of comics and their adaptations, you will usually only have a few at a time. And yeah, this one has some... Really, I'm, I'm not going to give all of it away. I may get into more details in the spoiler section. And another major appeal is that with their wild concepts, they can give com compelling commentary on real issues of greater efficiency than non-comic stuff. You know, watch Lindsay Ellis' video of the complex fields of the Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 if you've watched both of the Guardians movies for her excellent discussion with exploration of emotional issues related to close relationships and the impact trauma from their family life can have on them. And yeah, this movie also does have, you know, because it deals with so many different planets, it can comment on the interaction between, you know, in real life, it's different countries, but in the Star Wars galaxy, it's the interaction between different 
planets in the galaxy and kind of political issues. Now, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features the following, and I am going to be discussing at least some of this following potentially triggering content. Torture, kidnapping, ableism slash disability, mental illness, xenophobia, body horror, corruption, race, genocide, minorities, and slavery. Now, sometimes in these videos I get into, you know, if there is some potentially triggering content that I wish had been removed, you know, for a lot of these videos I haven't really had a lot to say there, so you should skip it, but I do think it would be great if the movie wasn't racist. I realize that the movie isn't aware that it's racist, but that doesn't excuse it. And yeah, I'll be talking about race when I get into the characters section. And right, please note I have a tendency to sometimes when I'm discussing a sensitive subject use descriptive terms that I consider neutral, that other people consider negative. So if I say something that sounds judgmental, it may very well just be that I take for granted that people know I'm being descriptive and not judgmental. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. And also, I will do my best to pronounce the names correctly. If I get it wrong, it's not that I'm intentionally making fun of them. And yes, to clarify, I'm talking about the the names of like real people. I'm not talking. If I get a name wrong about a Star Wars thing, I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna freak out over it. That's not. I care about the Star Wars franchise, but I'm not. Anyway, the movie is rated PG, and so is this video. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. Now, anything negative I say in this video is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. It's not that I'm upset at how it compares to other movies like it, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing other Star Wars movies. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this video are fair criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Now, in some ways, this movie is like episodes four through six, so I'm not going to mention all of the things where they're similar. I'm going to talk about the ways that they're different from one another, so I'm not just repeating myself. Now, you don't need to have watched anything else before watching this movie, though you will appreciate aspects of it more if you watched episodes 4 through 6, and I do think that was, you know, I'm not a huge fan of, you know, George Lucas says it's kind of like poetry, they rhyme, so, something like that. That's why he has a bunch of references and such. I don't love all of them, but I do think, you know, you can you can at least tell that there was he cared about that, which, you know, sometimes you'll watch a prequel and it's like, did they did they watch the original movie? Did they understand the original movie? Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, is it is possible that I would touch my face like I just did. I want to assure you I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. Now, now I base this review on the the version of the movie that is on Disney Plus. I have also watched the original DVD release. I have not watched the 3D one. I, I distinctly remember 2012 when the 3D one came out and I I was like this movie doesn't need 3D. It wasn't filmed to be made into 3D. No, George Lucas, you cannot have more of my money for the same movie just because you post-converted a movie that was... Anyway. You know, I, I guess I get it. You know, there were a lot of 3D movies. You know, Av Avatar really brought the 3D craze back, but... No, this movie did not need to be 3D. Anyway. So, I would, I would probably... If, if you have a choice in the matter, I would, and, and it's not hugely expensive, I would 
I, I think the DVD release is better than the, you know, the Disney Plus version adds in some stuff that was, you know, I th yeah, let's see. I think it both adds in stuff that they originally cut for the DVD, and I guess also the theatrical. I'm not 100% certain how big a difference there is between DVD and theatrical. And they, like, went in and added CG later. You know, it's fine. If if Disney Plus is the only version you have, you know, it's not. it doesn't ruin the movie or something, but... I, I would say the, the DVD one is better paced. Now, I if I had to guess, I would say, you know, I've probably watched this 36 times. Cer certainly it has been dozens of times. And the very first viewing was in the year it came out, in 1999. Now, this is one of those movies that I've owned for a really long time. The first time I watched it was a number of years ago. I've watched it a bunch of times over the years. And it really made a strong impression on me. I've been wanting to talk about it on camera for a long time. This, you know, if, if this is the first Star Wars review by me that you watch, then, you know, I didn't always have access to the majority of these movies. So, you know, that's why I didn't do these reviews years ago. Someone did gift me the prequels on DVD, and I almost never like. I'm not 100% certain I've ever given away a DVD. Like, I'll, I'll buy a gift for someone else. I'll buy a DVD and, and gift it to someone else. But I don't usually, I don't, I don't give away my own DVDs. I don't sell them. I don't throw them out. And I think the fact that I own this movie on DVD is a pretty strong piece of evidence to support that statement. And the most recent viewing was right before I started recording this video, so it would be fresh in my mind. So, this is set 30 years prior to A New Hope. Two Jedi Knights try to help the planet Naboo when it's facing a trade embargo. And I suppose, yeah, a, a communications shutdown, interruption, something like that. I forget the exact term they use, but yeah, you know, they they prevent the planet Naboo from communicating with uh, other planets, and uh, yeah, I think that's what I'm gonna yeah. So you know, the it it would appear that the Trade Federation will start a war with Naboo. They might invade. At the end of this movie, you will in fact know what the title means. You will know if this is a movie about someone who's a menace to phantoms or a menace that's hidden. Is the title silly? Are the prequels titles still in general silly? More than the original trilogy titles? You know, I, I don't know. I, I think maybe at least a little. But I think, honestly, if George Lucas could have gotten away with as silly titles as the the okay return of the jedi is maybe but you know a new hope like if you heard that there was a movie called a new hope you wouldn't necessarily immediately picture star wars episode four you know it could be something else empire strikes back we're we're getting a little more into the the but but yeah Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. Attack of the Clones especially sounds like a movie that came out in the 1950s. Which, I, I, I feel like George Lucas, yeah, to get back to the point I was making, I feel like George Lucas, if he thought he could get away with it, if he thought it didn't mean that they would get destroyed by critics and media in general, I think there's a chance he would have called the original trilogy. He would have given them 1950s sci-fi names. I, I honestly, like, I, I, like, a, there are definitely things about the prequels. Okay, yeah, you know what? There we are. I kind of love that about the prequels. I kind of love that he was like, you know what? No one's going to prevent me. No one's, no one's going to tell me what to title my movie. 
I'm gonna kid. I'm I'm just straight up gonna like. If you didn't know Attack of the Clones was a Star Wars movie, like, let's see, I I can think of at least a couple. I I know. I realize not everybody agrees with me on this. I personally think some of the 1950 sci-fi movies are incredibly entertaining. It's like there's a couple of things in there. You know, you gotta you gotta put yourself in the mindset of someone from back then. There's definitely some some issues the way they talked to and about minorities is that but the 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 films themselves can be really fun. So yeah, if I like listed, let's see, to start with the one that's legitimately amazing and you if you at all think you can get through it and you can find a cheap version or something, you know, watch Invasion of the Body Snatchers. You know, and you have, let's see, what was it called again? This, this island, this, this, this island earth and Attack of the Clones, you know. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds exactly like something that would have come out back then. Now, and I have to admit, I... It is kind of interesting. According to IMDb Trivia, the core plot of the movie came from George Lucas's first draft of A New Hope, which he wrote in 1975. So, you know, that that is... It, it is cool that, that he, you know, after so long, got to make... You know, got to put on camera, on film, something that he wrote all the way back then and you know, evidently still wanted to use. I don't worship the original trilogy, no matter how much I do love A New Hope and Empire Strikes Back, which is a lot. I don't have any irrational hatred for the prequel trilogy. I try to judge them as movies first, as connected to the original trilogy second, and as the last Star Wars movies George Lucas will most likely ever direct third. If they were some of the best movies ever made, but you kind of have to pretend they're not connected to the original trilogy, then I would praise them for being great movies despite them not connecting to what they were meant to connect to. What they meant to connect. There we go. Got there eventually. The way George Lucas makes movies has changed over the course of his career. Just look at how different THX 1138 is from A New Hope or the original trilogy from the prequel trilogy. I didn't expect George Lucas to try to make these movies the exact same way he worked on the original trilogy, especially considering that he only, the only of the three that he directed was A New Hope. But I do think that he should have acknowledged that the way he makes movies had probably changed too much for him to make satisfying new Star Wars movies. With each of these, he tried to make the movie that he wanted to make, and he just didn't realize that the movie that he wanted to make was no longer what fans of the original trilogy wanted. And I, I'm just briefly, I think that a lot of the, a lot of the rage felt by lifelong fans of the original trilogy. Like when, you know, what, what was that documentary called? The People versus George Lucas or something like that, you know, some of that rage was excessive. Like the the it was clear that some of them took it personally. Like he walked into their house and started you know ruining like started breaking things or something. You know, it wasn't just he made a movie that they didn't like. It it went beyond that to them. I he do, he doesn't owe us fans anything. He doesn't. But I do think that if the prequels were substantially better, I don't think the disappointment and frustration and rage would have been anywhere near as strong. I think an argument could be made that no movie would have been completely satisfactory to lifelong fans, but I don't think that means that these movies were completely unfairly attacked by... yeah. Now, I really appreciate that after he completed the sequel trilogy, he was willing to sell the movie rights. 
to people who had a better chance of making satisfying Star Wars movies than he did. I've seen some theorize that the negative experience of making the original trilogy made him bitter, and it definitely is worth keeping in mind that with most of the original trilogy, there were things forcing him to make certain decisions, studios, other crew, actors who have the confidence to confront him about his dialogue writing skills, for lack thereof, and some of those pressures were not present during the making of the prequels, especially Phantom Menace. He did do some course correcting for the sequels, thankfully. I've seen some speak to, like, when you watch, like, behind-the-scenes footage, and I mean, I guess they just didn't realize it when they were filming it or editing it, or maybe the people who edited it didn't mind, but there are, like, there are... I haven't watched all of the behind-the-scenes, but I watched what was on the DVD. There... There are times in the behind-the-scenes when you can clearly tell that George Lucas has one perception of, you know, for example, the the audition. And some of the other people there are like, they're afraid to, you know, they're, they're clearly not comfortable arguing with him, at least not when he's there. There's one bit where like he, you know, he walks out of the room and then they start talking about, it. I mean, I kind of like the other audition better. I thought that that, you know... And, uh, yeah, that, that definitely contributed. You know, there, there were not enough people who were confident to tell him that he was making mistakes. The opening crawl of this movie starts by focusing on the taxation of trade routes. I'd just like to point out that one of the biggest audiences for this movie are children. You know what three of the most boring things to children are? Taxes, trade, and trade routes. Imagine if instead it was people's shops are being attacked, people out buying things are being assaulted, then a lot of kids could get into it. And I realize, you know, you couldn't word it exactly like that in the opening crawl, but let's, let's see. The opening crawl, I, th I think right now as it is, it says there is a dispute over the taxation of trade routes, something like that. Let's see. Going to certain stores can get you physically assaulted, something like that, you know. Then immediately, you know. Let's see. So that brings us to the. Let's see. Right. So, yeah, this movie is primarily about the the plot not about characters and i do think that that was a mistake and there is also some style over substance so that brings us i Yes, I, I will just briefly state, I am progressive, you know, if, if we're talking like American politics, you know, I, I'm, I, I would say the people that are closest to what I want, you know, the, the yeah, Bernie Sanders and AOC, the, the squad in general, are, yeah, now. So on the, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to briefly quote a fellow critic here. Despite all the exposition, it can also feel very confusing of who is doing what and why. And I think that is one of the, the biggest problems. It is very muddled of, of a story and storytelling. Now, there are a number of details that this movie includes. Some of them are retcons. Some of them are just explanations for things where we didn't know the explanation before. A lot of them just really don't make the movie any better, and some of them actively make the movie worse. And, yeah, so IMDb Trivia notes that the film was criticized by many fans for its perceived overuse of computer-generated sets and special effects. In reality, more miniature sets and props were made for this film than for the original trilogy combined. 
The same goes for Star Wars Episode 2 and 3. I've seen a number of people assert this as if this, which, true fact, I'm not arguing the, the veracity, it's, it's true. But they assert it as if it somehow proves that criticism wrong. Really, this is a failure to actually engage with the criticism. The criticism is the movie feels fake, inorganic. A lot of people assumed that there were more computer-generated elements than there were. You know, maybe you don't think that that matters, but at least engage on, you know, don't, don't be a bad actor. Be, engage with the criticism. You know, one, one of the things is that apparently when they were editing, if they had a shot with like three actors and they liked the, the you know, they, they like take five of actor one, take seven of actor two, and take one of actor three, then they, when editing, would Frankenstein these takes together and it was, I'm, I'm sounding like this frustrates me way more than it does. It just, they, yeah, they would Frankenstein them together. And, and yeah, I mean, I don't doubt for a second that that enabled George Lucas to put on screen exactly what he had intended. But you can tell that there's something off. And, and you know, a lot of, well, we can't really put our, if, uh, put our finger on exactly what it is that's wrong. So a lot of people assumed, oh, I guess it must be that there's so much CGI. Now, let's see. The... Yeah, and and this is a this is a comment from uh, the the site of a critic. To me, the film is terrible, even when viewed in isolation to the rest. It just doesn't work as its own self-contained story any more than it works as part of the larger franchise. I think there's... Yeah, it's, it's hard to argue with that. Once again, noting that that doesn't just mean that if you watch this and haven't watched episodes 4 through 6... Or, or you watch this and you make your judgment about this movie before watching episodes two and, two and three, that doesn't mean that it's, yeah. Even if you know, even if you know where it's going, both in in that episodes four through six are set after this, and that episodes two and three expand very specifically on this, yeah, it still doesn't quite work. And now, that brings us, yeah, and, and others point out that, yeah, I'm, I'm just, again, this is a comment from a critic site. People didn't react so strongly to the original Star Wars purely because of the special effects. It was because they loved the characters. All the characters had heart, and you wanted to spend time with them and see them succeed. And, yeah, that is one of the problems with this one. That just, you know, no matter how cool what is happening is, and, you know, if you watch it in isolation, if you pretend that these characters matter to you more than they actually do, which is very little, if any at all, yeah, you know, it can, it can be fun, but when you just stop and think about it, like, yeah, it's it's just it just doesn't work. There are some things that I love that this movie wants to do try to do and I just don't think that they pull them off. One of the biggest ones is that this movie clearly wants to comment on Hitler's rise to power. It does a great job working in a lot of details from that. If if you if you aren't watching this movie but you just look at like Either, either you're working off memory or you're like going off Wikipedia or something and you just look at, okay, so that's about Hitler, that's about Hitler, this is about Hitler, you know, it's, it's what was it Mark Twain said? A, a, a classic is a book that everybody wants to 
have read but no one wants to read. You know, if, if you just look at those details, I, I think it is extremely important to to warn against the, the signs of the rise of fascism. And that was clearly something that George Lucas wanted to do here. And I don't think that Star Wars, at least not at the time, in 1999, or maybe George Lucas wasn't the right person to do it, but yeah, could that they could handle complex politics like that. I, th I think Lucas should have chosen a franchise that could better handle that material. And honestly, I mean, if, if they put out something in the year 1999 and said, from the, from the guy who created Star Wars, a ton of people would have watched it. It didn't have to be Star Wars. And just, yeah. You know, but... I've, I've long said that the there is clear criticism of fascism in the original trilogy as well. But there, they managed to make it... Like, a, a bunch of people who watched the original trilogy dozens of times, you know, they didn't realize until the sequel trilogy, oh, wait, the bad guys are supposed to be fascists, you know? And I think that is a testament to how well it was, you know, yeah, the, the Lucas managed to fit it into the original trilogy much more smoothly. And obviously part of it is also just that if you, if you're making a movie that is about fascists, which once again, the original trilogy, the, the, I can't believe I'm blanking on one. I swear I won't spend forever remembering this. The Empire, the Galactic Empire, are fascists in the original trilogy. You know, the 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 uniforms, the the fact that, you know, the people in control are largely white men with with like Yeah, and, and several of them are, like, older white men, you know, there are no minorities giving orders in the galactic empire in the original trilogy. And, yeah, if, if you have that, if you have a movie where the bad guys are fascists, it's not difficult to criticize fascism. But if you have a movie that's set before the fascists have power it becomes a lot more you have to be really subtle about it for for criticism of fascism to work if you don't have bad guys who are fascists you know and and that's some of the trouble with this movie like the, this movie more than what's happening in this movie clearly when you watch this movie you're supposed to be afraid of what is coming later and that's just, that's a lot to ask from an audience, once again, where a, a chunk of them are going to be children and others are going to view it as if the movie is made for children. You know, the once you've introduced Ewoks, you can't expect people to look at your movie, you know, just... You, you can't expect people to watch and think it and, and be expecting Citizen Kane. You know, you just, you, the, the train, that train has sailed, you know? And I, I've already talked about, I'm, I'm not going to go on a rant about the Ewoks. I said all I need to say when I did the video on episode six, but George Lucas, you know, basically held up of a giant megaphone and shouted so it could be heard all around the world star War i'm making star wars movies for children so when you watch this movie and suddenly you have this like i know i know adults who are intelligent in other ways who have trouble like picking up on signs of of the rise of fascism you know it is that's that's the problem it is so It can be very subtle. It isn't always, but it can be very subtle. And 
yeah, it just, yeah, moving on. So, this movie was written by, it, George Lucas is actually the only credited writer on this one. I, I believe it's the, I, I, I don't think a, a single movie in the original trilogy only had him, had only him as the credited writer, but yeah, he wrote the screenplay and the story, and once again, the movies that I've watched that he's written are the original trilogy, the sequel trilogy, THX 1138, and American Graffiti. And according to IMDb Trivia, George Lucas asked Lawrence Kasdan to write the script, but he turned it down because he thought with Empire and Return of the Jedi, Lucas's relationship to the movies had taken one step back, and that he alone should take responsibility and make exactly the movie he wanted to make. I do get I, I do get that. I, I just wish it had turned out better. I think, you know, this movie really is an excellent example of why Lucas has an incredible imagination, and he, he does make some really great creative choices, but he needs someone to rein him in. And according to Wikipedia, throughout the 1980s, Lucas said he had no desire to return to Star Wars and had cancelled his sequel trilogy by the return by the time of the return of the Jedi. However, because Lucas had developed most of the backstory, the idea of the prequels of prequels continued to fascinate him. In the early 1990s, Star Wars saw a resurgence in popularity in the wake of Dark Horse's comic line, Timothy Zahn's trilogy of novels. Lucas saw there was still a large audience for his idea of a prequel trilogy. And with the development of special effects generated with computer-generated gener computer imagery, Lucas considered returning to his saga and directing the film. In 1993, it was announced in Variety and other sources that he would be making the prequels. Lucas began outlining the story. Anakin Skywalker, rather than Obi-Wan Kenobi, would be the protagonist. The series would be a tragedy examining Darth Vader's origins. A relic of the original outline was that Anakin would, like his son, grow up on Tatooine. Lucas also began to change the prequel's timeline relative to the original series. Instead of filling in the tangential history, they would form the beginning of a long story that started with Anakin's childhood, ended with... Uh, right, yeah. Ended with his death. I am, I am spoiling episodes 4 through 6. This was the final step toward turning the franchise into a saga. I don't have any problem with movies where the director references another movie that that you know that that he made. I think it works incredibly well in Nightmare on Elm Street 7. And I realize Halloween 2018 is not it's not the same director. Trust me, I can tell the difference between John Carpenter and David Gordon Green. But with Star Wars, it just feels like George Lucas is building the movies around the references, even if the movies that he makes don't end up as good as if he gave himself more freedom. And, yeah, I'm just briefly going to point out, it seems pretty silly that the... the Actually, I guess technically that is a spoiler. I will, yeah, I'll, I'll get into it in my video on, yeah, technically, yeah, ep episode three. So it's not, I, I will get to it when I get there. Now, the, yeah, so the movie, the handling of plot twists is somewhat mixed. There aren't too many. A few of them are bad, and there aren't too few. A few of them are too easy to figure out for the viewer. But this is not one of those movies that only works until you learn the twist and then it completely falls apart. I've heard that some found it difficult to keep up with all the twists on the very first view. Actually, never mind. I'm not sure that's the twist. That's just the, the plot in general, not, not twist specifically. So, yeah, this was directed by George Lucas, and, yeah, uh, 
the movies I've seen that he's directed are the ones that I've seen that he's written. So, THX 1138, American Graffiti, the original trilogy, and the prequel trilogy. And, let's see, then... According to Wikipedia, in November 2015, Ron Howard confirmed that he, Robert Zemeckis, and Steven Spielberg were con approached by Lucas to direct The Phantom Menace. All three approached directors told Lucas he should direct the film, as they each found the project too daunting. And, you know, it's, it's kind of neat that Ron Howard did end up directing a Star Wars movie, although that one wasn't terribly popular, so I guess there's a chance that he was right, but no. I'll get to it when I get to it. And, yeah, so the various critics have said that they rushed into filming this movie before the script was completely done. And George Lucas, it, you know, it was, it was clear to, to the, some of the other people working on the movie that George Lucas wanted to film quickly and then move on, rather than focusing on getting good performances. And another critic said the movie is too shiny. It feels like a movie as, you know, not real. And it lacks grit. You know, there, there are countless movies that feel real. And in fact, you know, a lot of things about the original trilogy, maybe not the movies as a whole, feel real because they're clearly set in some other place. But you feel like, okay, that, space, you know, that thing probably can't fly through space in real life. But I'm certain that it exists as a physical thing and I could walk around. You know, you see the Millennium Falcon, you see the interior of the Millennium Falcon, you're like, okay, I'm sure that thing can't fly through space in real life. But I could walk, okay, maybe not me personally, but someone who had access to that. Is that a prop? I guess it's a set. Someone who had access to that set could walk around the inside of the Millennium Falcon. And that's just, it. That doesn't feel like the case with this movie. And, yeah, the, the fact that he, you know, the good performances requires more than talented performers. Because this movie has many extremely talented performers. It also requires that they're comfortable with the material and that they completely believe what they're saying and doing and that's that is an uphill battle when you're dealing with star wars dialogue written by george lucas and star wars the that that world in general you know the i, I think maybe lucas forgot that you know to him like he can see the entire movie in his mind that that's not a problem but the actors can't you know they 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 work based on what's in the script and what he tells them and what they maybe look at as like, you know, okay, they, they maybe get to, you know, okay, now you're flying in the spaceship. They maybe get to look at like a, um, uh, uh, what's it called? A, a, an artist rendering of what they expect it to eventually look like, but they don't fully know. And it kind of shows that they're not, the, the performances are not very natural, very, very self-assured in this movie. And, yeah, so, as usual for a Star Wars movie, the first shot is space, and then it pans. And the opening, you know, it, it does a decent enough job, like... The opening crawl lost a lot of people, but the, the actual opening scene, you know, we see this, this ship fly into this, ah, what's it called again? I, I guess it's a space station. Yeah, a, a ship flying, you know, approach on approach to a space station. And, you know, one of the two Jedi, Qui-Gon Jinn, tells the pilot, contact the, the Trade Federation leader I'm gonna go with and tell him we wish to board immediately and we we want to negotiate with him as soon as at all possible you know that that right away tells you you know okay this guy doesn't mess around and you know the the like and and 
when when the pilot then communicates that to the 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 I forget exactly what it's called, so I'm just gonna go with oh viceroy actually I think yeah the, the trade federation viceroy and the viceroy you know we immediately get get a sense uh he's he's lying he says we're not doing anything illegal of course you can come right in we're sure you're gonna you're gonna find that everything is completely as it should be you know but yeah you you can you you get the sense that that there's something wrong here and yeah now i am not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but if it's with what came before i'm more or less happy with how the movie ends it doesn't hmm actually come to think of it deus ex machina maybe maybe one or two and there's definitely at least some convenient writing and yeah so whether or not the movie loses your interest along the way the pod race definitely tests your patience and some parts of it are more enjoyable than to, to watch than others the the action scenes are again like in a vacuum if you cared more about the characters they would be great action scenes especially the lightsaber action which is you know easily it's it's in a vacuum it's the the lightsaber action is significantly better than anything we saw in the original trilogy which is you know simply because the the technology was there to allow that you know like when you decide that your your hero you know yeah your heroes and your villains are going to be using you know swords where the blade is light obviously you can't have extremely fast moving action you know incorporating those if the technology just isn't there and you know by 1999 the technology was there uh, now is it worth suffering through some of the parts to get to the later parts barely like if you've never watched this movie and you're really passionate about Star Wars I would say at least a single viewing you know if if you're finding trouble getting through it maybe pause it and continue watching it later but i do think you know it is still a star wars movie it's just the first one that's not good and the yeah the the you know the the imagination on display the the world is is still you know that's that's the thing you know like if you if you sat down and played one of the games if you were lucky if you picked the right game you'd find a world that had as much imagination as the movies if you were unlucky the game would yeah would not but with the yeah you know they're they're the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy they're you know none of the movies are completely perfect some are significantly better some are significantly worse but there's always a lot of imagination on display and quite good not always seamless special effects now a problem with a number of prequels is that the prequel provides a piece of information or characterization of the like that actually makes the other movies make less sense be less satisfying and yeah you know that's that the you know i when I, when i first put that in my i have a i have a ah, what's it called i have a file that where i put all the things that i want to talk about in a movie i have a file that i use as sort of the 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 bones of that and then i add in a bunch of things and when I added, you know, problem with a number of prequels, you know, the first examples that came to mind of those, the problems that I just mentioned are the Star Wars prequels and Men in Black 3, you know. Yeah, it's, it's worse than in the original trilogy. If you care about continuity, it will drive you up a wall. 
I don't personally think it has to mean a lot as long as the changes make the more recently released film better. But I don't think they do a lot of, again, a lot of these changes make it worse. And there's definitely at least some fan, fan, fan service going on. Some of the details about Anakin are kind of ridiculous in all the things he can do and how good he is at doing them. You know, like, if you watch this movie and you didn't know, oh, eventually this guy's going to become Darth Vader, is going to be one of the most intimidating, you know. Yeah, if you watch it not knowing that, you'd be like, oh, come on, that's ridiculous, you know. But, yeah, as you watch it, it's just supposed to be, yeah, look at how, how amazing he is, you know. Even at, even at age, like, I think he's supposed to be nine in this movie. He's still amazing, you know. He's, he's already amazing. Now, the, there are some things in the movie that subvert expectations, and force powers are used to great effect here because of special effects getting better, as well as these are characters that are better at using them, and we see several new force powers. This is one of those movies where, for a number of the characters, you just don't learn all that much, and yeah, it does make it more difficult to connect with these characters. And there are some characters that are not very likable, or at least there are aspects to them that make them harder to like, and that also means it's more difficult to... You know, it's, it's a movie that in a lot of ways just keeps the viewer at arm's length. So, the... The cast. Liam Neeson plays Qui-Gon Jinn, a Jedi Master. Lucas originally wanted to cast an American actor in the role, but cast Neeson, who is Northern Irish, because he considered that Neeson had great skills and presence. Which is... 100% true. You, you might in fact say that he has a very specific set of skills. Lucas said Neeson was a master actor who the other actors will look up to, who has got the qualities of strength that the character demands. And Liam Neeson was apparently so excited at the idea of working with George Lucas that he did not read the script before signing on. And boy, can you tell. A lot of his line readings He's clearly frustrated with the material, and to be fair, for some of that, it does work. He can be kind of enjoyable to watch. Like, his tone is like, please just shut up and stop talking to me, you know, and, and yeah. The character is in a number of situations where it is like, these people, these, the people that I have to work with, unbelievable and and yeah for for that it, it works like and Qui-Gon is a character with some shades of gray less than 50 which does make him more interesting he doesn't always do things the way other Jedi say things should be done and yeah that is that that aspect works he's probably the closest the movie has to having a lead character and, right, so this is another comment from a critic's site. Let's see. So, so yeah, this guy says, I haven't seen this movie in years, but one thing always stuck with me the most. It's the Liam Neeson, arguably the lead, since he's all in so much of the movie, is absolutely freaking boring. He's just this guy with no real personality other than being an a-hole at times. He sometimes completely forgets the feelings or opinions of other people involved. And Ewan McGregor uh, plays Obi-Wan Kenobi, Qui-Gon's 25-year-old Jedi Padawan, who holds his master in high regard but questions him at times, especially when it seems he's breaking the rules of the Jedi. McGregor was cast from a short list of 50 actors, all of whom had to be compared Two pictures of young Alec Guinness, who portrayed the elderly Obi-Wan to make a believable younger version. 
McGregor had a vocal coach to help his voice sound closer to Guinness, and he also studied several Guinness performances from his early work and the original Star Wars films. And you can tell, and they, they actually... He, he does really great. It doesn't feel like impersonation or parody, which can sometimes be a problem when you recast a role like this. And, yeah, you know, IMDb Trivia also points out, you know, he, he studied to ensure accuracy in everything, from his accent to the pacing of his words. And it really, it's, it's incredible. Like, if you... If you, if, if you, if, if there was someone who knew that, the, yeah, let's see. Yeah, if, if there was someone who knew that this movie was made after the old ones were made, they might believe, okay, I'm, I was gonna say, like, time travel to get a young Alec Guinness. I guess what I'll say is they might think that he was like his son or something, but yeah, it's it's incredible. And Kenneth Branagh was originally considered for the part of young Obi Wan. That's that's very interesting. I I yeah, I don't think it would have been it would have worked as well. One critic points out, Neeson and McGregor seem so focused on hitting their marks for the blue screen that they barely make eye contact, let alone generate any genuine emotion. And, and yeah, it's, it's very true. The, the, the actors did actually, not always, but a, a bunch of the time, if, if you see one shot, that has like three or four characters that are played by human beings. Most of the time, they were on set together. They were they were as close to each other as the camera makes it appear that they are. But because of the the challenging material, the lack of detailed direction from George Lucas. The, the, yeah, the, the, you, you can, and yeah, and, and aforementioned special effects considerations, yeah, they just, the, the, it, it feels like they're, they're individually struggling, you know, there, there, there isn't like, on, on some movies with a lot of special effects, if there's an actor who's used to working with special effects, they can kind of provide, they can, they can make the other actors feel more comfortable. Because, well, if that guy is that confident about it and he's got experience, I guess I can relax. Because he knows what, he'll, he'll say if there's something that, that I'm not doing great, you know, or if I just do it, the way he does it will be fine, you know. And that is also one of the... I, I'm not sure there were that many actors on this movie that were extremely used to special effects. And and some of the some of the effects work for this was, like, completely new. You know, stuff we hadn't seen before. So, of course, they're not going to be that familiar with it. And again, without George Lucas, like, that's, that's an important part of being a director is getting the 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 actors to be uh, to to feel comfortable around special effects stuff and yeah for for some directors you can really tell you know like if you watch i guess it's not really fair to talk about avatar specifically since they could see what it looked like yeah you know they could they could record they could they could do a take and then go back and watch you know the take they just watched and there would also there would already be at least some computer generated stuff to to compare to for the next take but if you go back if you watch you know terminators 1 and 2 aliens 
clearly James Cameron was able to make the cast, you know, first of all, believe that, you know, okay, when I know right now it's, it doesn't look like much, but when we're done, it's going to look convincing. You know, that's an important first step. He was able to get them to be comfortable, even though they were, you know, okay, now the truck is exploding. You can't see it right now. And when we show it in the movie, it's going to be a model. But imagine that the truck, it's its right over there and it's exploding right now. Okay, your, your face is going to take up most of the, the screen for this. So it's important that you get it exactly right, you know. He's, he was able to do that, and that, you know, part of that was he was so used to working with effects. Before he became a director, he was used to working with effects, so he knew how he had to look at it. And, yeah, once he was directing actors, it, it is difficult. And, and George Lucas, I think the... I think when you look at Empire Strikes Back, you can really see that the best way for George Lucas to make a really great Star Wars movie is for him to not direct it and for people who have who are who are willing to stand up to him to have a lot of of control. Like Lawrence Kasdan and I can't believe I'm blanking on the director's name. I, Irwin Kirshner clearly had a lot to do with making that movie as great as it was and i think you know let's i think if he was if he was one of the writers but other people would like help change for example dialogue and characterization and such i think that is probably the way that it best turns out I have to admit, I think I watched one of, um, yeah, I, I watched one of the Indiana Jones. I watched one of the Indiana Jones movies. I am not 100% certain which one it was. I think it might be Temple of Doom. I'm pretty sure it wasn't Losers of the Raided Covenant. Ah, Ark. Screwed up the punchline there, but yeah, yeah. Raiders of the Lost Ark. Oh wait, yeah, Ark, not Covenant. Yeah, whatever. Never mind. Moving on. I'm almost certain he wrote that, and then Spielberg directed that. So if I if I had a more clear memory of what that was like, maybe I'd have a good idea. Because I think Spielberg is pretty good at c conveying to actors what they're going to be reacting to. It's It's been a while since I watched a Spielberg movie with a lot of special effects, but I, I seem to recall that he's pretty good at that. And, you know, that's the... Th just... I, I wish George Lucas had just completely accepted, you know, that he needed someone to help in in that regard. Anyway... And, yeah, this is another comment from a critic site. If you learn anything from The Phantom Menace, it's that divorcing yourself from all earthly and emotional attachments just leads you to being a boring, holier-than-thou a-hole. Natalie Portman plays Queen Amidala, the 14-year-old queen of Naboo, who hopes to protect her planet from the Trade Federation. And over 200 actresses auditioned for the role. The production notes stated that the role required a young woman who could be believable as the ruler of that planet, but at the same time be vulnerable and open. Portman was chosen especially for her performances in Leon the Professional and Beautiful Girls, which impressed Lucas. He stated, I was looking for somebody who was young, strong, along the lines of Leia, and Natalie em embodied all those traits and more. I would have to agree. Portman was unfamiliar with Star Wars before being cast, but was enthusiastic about being cast as a character she expected to become a role model, which is exactly the right reason. Portman said, It was wonderful playing a young queen with so much power. I think it would be good for young women to see strong women of action. 
a strong woman of action who is also smart and a leader. And yeah, there's definitely a resemblance with Leia. Royalty, she's smart, she takes part in the action. And yeah, the... the I, I, with better direction, I think she could have done an absolutely incredible job. You know, she was and is unbelievably talented. And yeah, according to IMDb Trivia, Natalie Portman worked extensively with a voice coach on what kind of dialect the Queen Amidala would have. They settled on a classically imperious kind of tone, the type that Catherine Hepburn or Lauren Bacall would have used in their heyday. Portman's voice was then electronically lowered in post-production to make her sound more queenly. And these are among the things that lead to her leaden performance. You know, the the Yeah, the 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 dialect is clearly not something she's complete. Like, like just off the bat, it does it. I have to admit, I I don't think I've watched very much. Is it Audrey Audrey Hep Catherine Hepburn, Lauren Bacall? Like, let's see, Bacall. So we're talking like The Big Sleep. For that kind of dialogue, that kind of movie. That works incredibly well, but for this kind of thing, like the 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 Star Wars universe is so much more like the uh, there's there's passion in both, but they show the passion in different ways, and it really limited how much she could express like that, and then the the voice pitching. You know, the, the, it just, it means that the performance she gave on set and then what they changed it to in, in post-production kind of, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it's the, it's again, this, this kind of fake, fakeness that it, it causes to, to, you know, you you watch the movie and you just feel. I, I mean, that's not that's not her real voice. That's I I, you know, I know I know what she sounds like. That's not. I've heard, you know, I've seen other movies from around the same time. That's that's not at all what she sounds like, and yeah, it just it it feels it again keeps you at an arm's length. It it me it makes it more difficult to engage with. It's it's like if you met someone for the first time. And they were really nervous, so they were trying to do. They were trying to change their voice to something they thought you would find a, more appealing, and and you can you can tell, and you just feel like just just relax, just you know, I'm I'm sure you'll be fine. Just relax and be yourself, and it's it's difficult to. How do you how do you engage with a character, who's never being themselves, you know. You know, not everybody loves the Queen. Some wanted to dilly-dally daily to delay the Lady Lita, but they failed. Jake Lloyd played Anakin Skywalker, a nine-year-old slave boy and skilled pilot who dreams of becoming a Jedi. Hundreds of actors were tested across the UK, Ireland, Canada, and the United States before the producers settled on Lloyd, who Lucas considered met his requirements of a good actor, enthusiastic, and very energetic. Producer Rick McCallum said that Lloyd was smart, mischievous, and loves anything mechanical, just like Anakin. He is one of the comic relief characters, and as such, people will feel that he is annoying. The film goes too far to get laughs out of him. A lot of people really hate his performance. I'm with Mark Hamill. Jake did exactly what George asked him to, and did and does not deserve all the hatred that he's gotten. I get being angry about the character, but George wrote him and directed him. I've only watched, this is the only movie that I've watched that Jake Lloyd has a part in. If I had to go off this, it would appear that he's not that great of an actor, but, you know, for, for one thing, that's not really on him. His parents are the ones who made the final decision of whether or not he would be an actor at that age. Screen Crush did an excellent video, I guess, by now, a month ago, talking about the first Home Alone movie how it's really about solace, solipsism. 
I would argue that Macaulay Culkin's performance in that movie is far superior to that of Jacob Lloyd in this movie, and he's also expected to act very difficult, varied situations, but I can imagine that Chris Columbus is a much better actor's director, and the material is a lot better. Also, please do note that almost no one gives a good acting performance in this movie, including such incredibly talented people as Liam Neeson, Natalie Portman, Ewan McGregor, Terrence Stamp. Like, you know, I, 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 I know that for some people, you know, this is what they have to... I, th I think this was the very first thing I saw Ewan McGregor in, but it was not the first thing he did. If you watch, like, it's not for everyone, and it's definitely do not try to eat dinner right before, during, or after watching Train Spotting. But if you, that movie, he gives an incredible performance. You know, you watch that movie and you're like, no wonder this guy has a career. This is just, he's, he's incredibly talented, you know, and in this, just very little of the, of the talent of all these people shines through. Now, according to, I, I listened to the commentary track, Lucas said of introducing Anakin, he's a good-natured person, the opposite of what we think of Vader, so it would be compelling to see him become Vader. What choices does he make that lead him to become bad? He wasn't born to be bad. Yeah, okay, the, that last bit, I changed it a little to make a very bad dad joke. And, yeah, according to IMDb Victoria, Anakin's theme is a musical variation on the Imperial March, aka Darth Vader's theme from Empire Strikes Back. And Jake Lloyd has said he retired from acting because of the trauma he experienced after playing Anakin Skywalker. According to Lloyd, other children con constantly teased him about the role, for example, for example, making lightsaber sounds whenever he walked by. Lloyd also said that the situation was made worse because, in his opinion, the film did not meet the fans' expectations. Despite this, Lloyd has reprised the role of Anakin in several video games and has appeared at Star Wars conventions and events. And according to Wikipedia, over 3,000 actors auditioned for the role of Anakin Skywalker, including Cameron Finley, Justin Burfield, and Michael Ang Angarano. I have to admit, I am not familiar with two of those, but Justin Burfield from Unhappily Ever After and Malcolm in the Middle? Yeah, I I have to admit, I don't really... That... I have a hard time seeing that. I, he's talented, for sure. I think he gives... I, I have to admit, I don't remember that much of his performance from Unhappily Ever After, but certainly he gave great performances in at least some episodes of Mountain in the Middle. I, I couldn't tell you how many episodes I've watched of that. I just know it's at least several. But whether it's like five or fifty, I could not tell you. And, I yeah, one, one critic pointed out, George Lucas seems incapable of telling a Star Wars story other than a young boy with great things in his future. And according to IMDb Victoria, the first chapter of the novelization is entirely about Anakin and pod raising. This scene does not appear in the movie. And Ian McDermott plays Senator Palpatine. And I suppose I'm not I I'm not going to talk too much about I'll just say I, th I think he does a, a really good job. His performance requires some several different things that are very different from each other, and he does a really yeah I yeah that's and Ahmed Best plays Jar Jar Binks, a clumsy Gungan exiled from his homeworld, taken in by Qui Gon and Obi Wan. Best was hired after casting director Robin Groen saw him on a stomp performance in San Francisco. Best was originally intended to provide motion capture data, but his offer to voice the character was accepted. On the set to provide references for the other actors, Best was clothed in a suit made of foam and latex and a headpiece. 
Best's film performance was later replaced with a computer-generated character. Best frequently improvised movements to make Jar Jar look as clumsy and comedic as possible. And yeah, he is he is the main com comic relief character. And the yeah, he definitely goes the the film goes really far to get laughs out of him. Some of the problems with this movie come from the fact that Lucas was trying to do something similar to what he grew up on, so he's using tropes that weren't acceptable by 1999, even if they were in the 50s and 60s. Jar Jar Binks is an offensive stereotype of Jamaicans. The character is clearly supposed to appeal to the children in the audience. It's like if the Ewoks were in way more of the movie and were more aggressively cute, annoying, prone to getting in the way, important to the plot. Even his own people can't stand him. I realize that there are elements in these movies that are mainly supposed to appeal to children, but other than the Ewoks and Jar Jar, they tend not to be so obnoxious to adults. I would argue that pretty much any Disney animated movie from the 90s is less obnoxious, even though all of them appeal to children are made primarily for children. And according to Wikipedia, many aspects of the scripting and characters were criticized, especially that of Jar Jar Binks, who was regarded by many members of the older fan community as toyetic, a merchandising opportunity, rather than a serious character. Kenneth Turan of the Los Angeles Times described Binks as a major miscue, a comic relief character who's frankly not funny. Drew Grant of Salon wrote, perhaps the absolute creative freedom director George Lucas enjoyed while dreaming up this the flick's comic relief. End quote. With no studio execs and not many an independently minded actor involved, is a path to the dark side. There has been some controversy over whether several alien characters reflect racial stereotypes. For example, the oafish, slow witted Jar Jar Binks has long droopy ears reminiscent of dreadlocks and spoke with what many perceived as a Caribbean patois reminiscent of Jamaican Creole. Drew Grant describes the character as servile and cowardly, a black minstrelish stereotype on par with Step and Fetch It. Georgetown University professor of African American Studies Michael Eric Dyson says that the entire Gungan species seems suggestive of a primitive African tribe, with Boss Nas, their leader, portrayed as a fat, bumbling caricature of a stereotypical African tribal chieftain. The greedy and corrupt Nymoidians of the Trade Federation speak with East Asian accents, and the unprincipled trader Watto has been interpreted as a Jewish stereotype reminiscent of Charles Dickens' character Fagin. Lucas has denied all these implications, instead criticizing the American media for using opinions from the internet as a reliable source for news stories. Lucas added that it reflects more the racism of the commenters than it does the movie. However, animator Rob Coleman said that he viewed footage of Alec Guinness as Fagin and Oliver Twist to inspire his animators in the creation of Watto. I think George Lucas isn't consciously aware of the stereotypes that he grew up with being racist. I don't think that he, like, actively, th like, I, th I think it's an unconscious bias. You know, if if you asked him, I don't think he would say, you know, no, no matter who asked him, even if it was someone that he was sure would never tell anyone else, I don't think he would say that, you know, non-whites aren't worth as much as whites. You know, this movie has more than one black man in the galaxy. Many of them are heroic military people, not cannon fodder. But it is still wrong and he should have used this as a as a teachable moment instead of trying to distract and claim that he did absolutely nothing wrong i really empathize with the the actor ahmed best because based on behind the scenes footage he clearly put a lot of effort into his performance and the the racist characters are some of the only ones that aren't extremely similar to characters in the original trilogy, maybe Obi Wan in this isn't that much like O T O G O B, but Qui Gon is a lot like him. And one critic said that Jar Jar Binks is like a Three Stooges character; he's just stupid. Comparatively, C three PO is capable but neurotic, which is a lot less annoying as comic relief goes. According to IMDb Trivia, concept artists based the, the design of Jar Jar Binks on 
As a cross between a duck-billed dinosaur and an emu, his neck movements were based on the movements of long-necked birds like cranes, herons, and ostriches. His skin texture was based on frogs and parrotfish. And Cosmo Variety Hour points out that every character in the movie except for Jar Jar and Anakin talk like weird Shakespeare robots. Characters are always coming up with a plan, hardly ever... We hardly ever have anyone talking about anything other than the immediate plot. It makes the movie boring and have no stakes. And he said, I get so bored by the halfway point that I stop watching even if I'm MST 3 king it. Now, I've seen a number of people say that without Jar Jar for comic relief, the movie would simply be too dry since it has so many stoic characters. I agree that something was needed, but Jar Jar ain't it, chief. There is a saying that the best animators are akin to actors. People who do an incredible job animating characters get really into, well, animating characters. It's boring to animate a character just sitting still, not doing anything, that is distracting to watch for an audience member. And you see this problem when Jar Jar Binks and some other characters in this, well, have to sit still, not really be doing anything. So frequently, you know, the, the Jar Jar takes away the focus that it means that they, they have to keep him just off screen, not seen and not heard. And that just feels weird. Like, of course, a character doesn't cease to exist just because we're not looking at them or hearing them right then and there. But it kind of feels like that is what happens with him in this. Anthony Daniels does the voice of C-3PO, a protocol droid. He lacks a metal covering in this film. R2-D2 humorously referred to it as being naked. A puppeteer dressed in a color closely matching the background in a manner similar to the Japanese puppet theater Bunraku manipulated a skeletal C-3PO figure attached to his front while Daniels read his lines off camera. The puppeteer was erased from the film during post-production. And that is legitimately kind of cool, seeing C-3PO before he was completed. And, like, you know, they couldn't possibly have done this before they made this movie. So, or certainly, they couldn't have done it. Let's see, when was the last one? 1983. They would not have been able to do... Like, it would have to be, like, only close-up of the body part, of, of certain body parts or something. But, you know, that that is as, as wild as it sometimes is to think about when you watch the original trilogy. Except for, like, stuff that's been added digitally or whatever. But... That actually is the poor actor covered in this, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure it's actually metal, but it looks like metal. And it's covering his entire body. And, yeah. And Kenny Baker plays R2-D2, an astromech droid. Before the film's production started, fans campaigned on the internet to retain Baker as R2-D2. Lucas replied that the actor would reprise the role. Baker is used for scenes where R2-D2 bends forwards and backwards and wobbles from side to side. Robots and a digital model were used in other shots. And that is also a little cool that for this they actually, the, the robotic R2-D2 is apparently a robot for, for at least some of it. And uh, Panela August as Shmi Skywalker, Anakin's mother, concerned for her son's future. August, a veteran of Swedish cinema, was chosen after auditioning with Liam Neeson. She was afraid of being rejected because of her accent. But she also does, like, she... Uh, you could almost engage with her character. Like, you feel like, okay, this is a real person. You know, she is... She's a mother who's concerned about the well-being of her child. And, yeah. And, yeah, and, and her scenes between her and Liam Neeson, like... They, they they come close. They come close to, like, genuine emotion. emotion. Frank Oz does the voice of Yoda, the centuries-old Jedi Grandmaster, head of the Jedi Council. Yoda was mostly portrayed as a puppet designed by Nick Dudman based on Stuart Freeborn's original design. Oz controlled the puppet's mouth, and other parts were controlled by puppeteers using remote controls. Lucas fitted Yoda's filming around Oz's schedule as he finished and promote it in and out. 
a computer-generated Yoda is featured in two distant shots. Warwick Davis, who played the part of Ewok Wicket W. Warwick in Return of the Jedi, portrays him in one scene. He said he originally wanted to use a full-time digital Yoda, but the attempts did not work well enough at the time. And, yeah, from, from, from Attack of the Clones onwards, he is a digital creation. And they, they put, you know, the, yeah, let's see, what does it say? Beginning with the 2011 Blu-ray release of this movie, which was also used for the 3D reissue, a CG Yoda replaced the puppet entirely. And on on Disney Plus as well, the, the DVD I have, he is a puppet. But, and I've also seen some say that the puppet isn't as good as in the original trilogy. I kind of have to agree. I, I hate to criticize something that actually is a proper practical effect in this, but yeah. And Ray Park plays Darth Maul. I think I need to there, that's better. And yeah, he's he's awesome. There's yeah. Uh, according to IMDb trivia, before the look of Darth Maul was set, it went through a number of designs. Initially, George Lucas asked concept designer Ian McKay to draw his worst nightmare. McKay recalled one where the dead yet alive figure was pressing its face against a window during a thunderstorm, staring at him. He used that as a basis. The result was a portrait of a black-dressed demonic character with light blue skin, dark eyes, with long red strands falling from its head. Lucas found the picture too disturbing and said to McKay, Okay, now draw me your second worst nightmare. Benicio Del Toro was originally cast as Darth Maul, but was later left the project when the character's lines were cut. Ray Park, a martial arts champion with experience in gymnastics and sword fighting, was originally a member of the stunt crew. Stunt coordinator Nick Gillard filmed Park to demonstrate his conception of the lightsaber battles. Lucas and McCallum were so impressed with the test tape that they gave Park the, the role of Maul. His voice was considered too squeaky and was dubbed over in post-production by Peter Serafinowicz. Maul is intense and sinister, which are among the relatively few things that I've seen Park convincingly act. And... Yeah, Peter Serafinovitz said that all that, the only direction that George Lucas gave him was make him sound evil, which, I mean, voice acting especially requires, like, you, I, I, I believe there are some performances that came out great, even though the director wasn't that great, but that's because, like, the actor maybe helped develop the character or something. Peter Serafinovich, the movie hasn't come out yet. He's he's been told very little about Maul, and then that's the only direction he gives. He gives a really strong performance, actually. He's he gives one of the best performances, and yeah, it's it's. I mean, maybe the fact that he is isolated in a voice uh, in a vo voice recording booth. Like, somehow that helped him. The, the fact that he's not, you know, he's not hitting marks and worrying about special effects around him. Now... I think that... Right, and Silas Carson actually plays three roles in this. Wait. four roles in this, so that's, yeah, now, let's see, I think that might be it for, right, and 
in the in the commentary track, George Lucas says that the whole point of Phantom Menace is introducing the characters because the film is the first act of a play. And I think that's another problem with this that just he's not that concerned with making this movie in a vacuum devoid of context work well. He kind of expects you to watch all of the movies like maybe not in a single sitting, but you know, but watching this movie, I already mentioned I don't think it works in context either, but yeah, it really, like, if if you watch this, you, yeah, you can, you can tell that he's, he's not thinking that much about how to make this one really compelling, he's thinking about, okay, this movie gets that out of the way, then for the later ones, then it'll be set. I don't have to reintroduce the characters and such, you know, it just, yeah. Now. Right, and uh, yeah, the character writing, especially for the leads, could be more fresh for the franchise. And... Yeah, quoting a few fellow critics here, none of the human actors here make much of an impression. Character and personality take a backseat on this ride. Has a film director ever induced such terrible performances from such great actors? Liam Neeson, Wooden, Ewan McGregor, Monotone, and the Oscar-winning Natalie Portman, A Speaking Alarm Clock. And this, this critic gave it a 1 out of 10. You realize how much humor Harrison Ford brought to things without him. At times, the movie itself feel, feels frozen in carbonite. It's not that the movie has zero space battles or that they're bad, but yeah, you definitely miss a Han Solo or Wedge Antilles. At this point, I'd settle for an Admiral Akbar. Also, of course, there isn't a rebellion. The Galactic Empire doesn't exist at the time because that this movie is set. There's nothing to rebel against. They'd be rebels without a cause, but the rebellion was one of the most compelling parts of the original trilogy. And honestly, I think a strong argument could be made that you shouldn't even tell a Star Wars story in feature length that is set in a time without a rebellion and a galactic empire. At the very least, you shouldn't make it one of the official episodes. You should make it a spin-off or something. You know, when I record this, there are two feature length live action Star Wars spin-off movies that went to theaters. And both of them are set during a time of the Galactic Empire and Rebellion, even though the one about Han Solo, you know, yeah, the, the focus isn't on the Rebellion that was before he was involved. You know, he got involved with the Rebellion during, in the events of A New Hope. The movie is set before A New Hope. And... Yeah, and, you know, the, there are, yeah, some, some have pointed out there's no real reason for several of these characters to tag along, including to the point where at least one character who there's no reason to expect to be any good in a fight end up in battle situations. You know, sometimes there's barely a reason for them to interact. They're there because George Lucas wanted these characters to interact with each other where in the original trilogy, if characters interacted with each other, it was because they had goals that they could help each other with. There's no... Yeah. Look. Again, I do not like the Ewoks. I'm not going to go off on a rant about it right now. But even the Ewoks, there was a reason. Like, the... The, the good guys don't just... You know, they're, they're, they're not just like, oh, okay, well, we gotta do this fight, I guess these, I guess we can be around these Ewoks. No, the Ewoks take part in the battle, and for sure there are some bits where it's like, okay, but would they really win against, but at least they're, you know, they are warriors, they are fighting, and yeah, it just... And uh, some, you know, some have pointed out who is the protagonist of this movie, and yeah, I've already talked a little bit about that. But to to expand on that, comparatively, Luke is clearly the protagonist of the original trilogy. 
I personally think that the racism of the film is one of the worst aspects, one of the biggest problems with it. It frankly disgusts me to think about an entire generation of kids growing up thinking that Jamaicans, Asians, Africans, and Jews are inherently ridiculous, alien, less than. I really love how many white people, white men especially, say it's no big deal that the movie has such racist stereotypes. If Jar Jar sounded like a stereotypical southern man, then southerners would flip out. Another one of the by far worst things about this is how the hatred of characters like Jar Jar Binks and Anakin Skywalker negatively affected the two actors playing those characters, driving Jar Jar's actor on at best to seriously consider suicide and Jake Lloyd, who played Anakin Skywalker, to quit acting due to the bullying he faced. Let's be very clear, it is never acceptable to treat an actor badly based on a character that they play. If you're going to treat someone anywhere near that badly, first of all, it shouldn't be a kid who was around seven or eight when they were filming. Second of all, it had better be because they did something actually harmful in the real world, like express racism, homophobia, transphobia, or the like. And again, it is not acceptable to treat anyone anywhere near that badly. And when you look at special features and such, you know, behind the scenes, clearly both Ahmed Best and Jake Lloyd did understand their characters and wanted to do a really good job. <clears throat> that brings us to the dialogue. So... Some of the characters do have their own quote-unquote voice in dialogue. There is way too much exposition in the movie. It is clunky and awkward. Now, so the cinematography was handled by DP David Tattersall. And let's see. So he also DP'd Speed Racer, which that's one of the... I, I don't think that it ultimately works, but the movie was filmed incredibly well. Next also has good, and yeah, he returned for both episodes two and three. He also did Vertical Limit, the Green Mile, Soldier, and Con Air. So yeah, he's he's very, very talented. And... So, the yeah, the movie, the, the way that the movie is filmed, it is easy to follow when something suddenly happens, like action scenes. The movie doesn't have hyperactive cinematography when it should be more calm. Like, if two characters are talking calmly to each other, the, the cinematography is, is appropriately subdued. There aren't unnecessary shots. Now, that brings us to the editing. Now, this was edited by Ben Burt, who also edited the other two prequels, and Paul Martin Smith. The only other thing I've seen him edit was Titan AE. I forget how much else he has edited. I didn't copy that in. The editing keeps it easy to follow fast-moving scenes, like action scenes. It's more calm when that is called for. And ultimately, I guess there, hmm, there, there are scenes that it would be better if they weren't in the movie or if they were shorter, but that's not really an editing issue. It's a writing issue. The, the, it would be impossible to remove them in the editing process and for the movie to still make sense. It's simply, it, yeah. But yeah, the, the technical aspects of the movie are quite well handled. Now... Yeah, I'm just really briefly, I, yeah, so I, I, I had forgotten I had copied this in, so earlier I 
retold this from my memory, so I'm just going to briefly... Yeah, so according to IMDb Trivia, scenes of straightforward di dialogue may be comprised of up to six layers of computer com composited imagery. In one scene, Natalie Portman's best take had been take seven, while Jake Lloyd's was take one. The two takes were spliced together. However, Lloyd's mouth at the end of scene is still gaped open, so that the same segment from take 15, in which his mouth is closed, is patched in. Furthermore, when pa Portman appears to look down from Lloyd instead of up, those few seconds were run backwards, which unexpectedly caused steam in the background to rise in reverse. The problem was fixed by flipping the scene backwards. And then it goes on to say, all these fixes resulted in a seamless scene. It's uncanny, and I would say it's uncanny valley territory. We, the viewer, can tell something's off, and it irks us. It, again, the, the, just, if we're looking at something that's supposed to be fake, okay, whatever, but we're looking at it, it's being presented as if it's happening for real, and just, yeah, there's, there's, something is off, we can tell. According to Wikipedia, editing took two years. Paul Martin Smith started the process in England and focused on dialogue, dialogue heavy scenes. Ben Burt, who's also the film's sound editor, was responsible for action sequences under Nucleus's supervision. Nonlinear editing systems played a large part in translating Lucas's vision. He constantly tweaked, revised, and reworked shots and scenes. The final sound mix was added in March 1999, and the following month, the film was completed after the delivery of the remaining visual effects shots. So the let's see, that brings us to yeah. So special effects. So this is so far, but very likely ever the last time George Lucas directed a Star Wars movie without nearly constant visual effects, even in place of sets and entire characters. It, I'm not saying it never happened on this, but it wasn't constant. Yes, there are some entire characters that are CG. Yes, there are some scenes where sets are largely or entirely CG. But it gets it gets to be based I yeah, I think it's actually everything in in movies two and three. I I or or very very there are almost no sets that are just, that exist in the real world the way that they appear in the final film. Almost all of the, the sets are these green screen or blue screen rooms. So as many problems as this movie has, when you watch it, you can really soak that in. As bad as this movie does get, there are movies that are far more reliant on far worse effects from the late 90s, early 2000s than this. You know, special effects meant that they could have way more creatures, sets, etc. And there's at least a little too much in some scenes, but it gets, yeah, it gets even worse in episodes two and three. And So, according to Wikipedia, George Lucas said that writing the script was much more enjoyable this time around because I wasn't constrained by anything. You can't write one of these movies without knowing how you're going to accomplish it. With CG at my disposal, I knew I could do whatever I wanted. And that's part of the problem. No one told George Lucas no, including the visual effects department. And while the CG is impressive for the time, it does not hold up. And this is one of those movies that relied too heavily on it. For a while, I remembered it as there not being a single scary, not scary to adults, but scary to children and such, since it is important that children can watch these movies. You know, we're not talking like 1982's The Thing here. Alien creature that is a threat to a good guy character in this movie. I, you know, I, I thinking back to it, I was like, oh, I guess this is the first released one to not have that. And then when I really thought about it and watched reviews and such, I remembered there is one. It's just that I've always felt that it was so obviously a special effect that it didn't register for me as another star scary Star Wars creature. 
now I know not everybody agrees with me on this, but I do think that having a scary creature that is a threat to one of the good guys, at, at least one of those, is important to have a Star Wars episode. It's just... It, it underlines that this is a very threatening world. Now, the budget was $115 million and the box office was 1.027 billion so yeah it was it was pretty successful now let's see right so on sets according to you know George Lucas says on the commentary track, I wanted to have the characters on Tatooine, but in a much bigger city now that I could tech-wise accomplish that. And, yeah, you know, as, as a critic points out, the settings include a transparent underwater city, vast hollow senatorial sphere, and we have Coruscant, the planet-wide city, and yeah, the, the action is easy to make out. You can very clearly see what is going on, something that is not always the case in episodes two and three. The lighting on the action is strong in all three, but this one doesn't obscure the view of any of them. And this is the last George Lucas Star Wars film where Every time a lightsaber is turned on or off, it has weight to it. It doesn't feel like something that just happens all the time anyway. In a documentary or something, they said that before this movie, everyone we've seen engage in lightsaber battle were old men who were past their prime, young men who hadn't mastered it yet. So George Lucas wanted to show characters who were currently masters rather than using stunt doubles. It actually is the actors doing the fighting, which helps it have more impact. Honestly, the action scenes are probably the most emotional for the for the actors since they kind of they kind of have to get it like it, it has to look like life or death, you know, where a lot of the scenes, you know, George Lucas was just rushing through filming. Now, some people say that the lightsaber stuff is overly choreographed and this feels like a dance i respectfully but 100 percent disagree with them there is some great action from very early on in the film but this is the first star wars movie of the ones chronologically released where the opening doesn't grab you right away and this does continue the trait from the original trilogy there's never a huge chunk of the film in a row with zero action scenes and Let's see. Yeah, one uh, another comment on critic site points out no shaky cam. You know the the action is crisp, clear, has discernible geography, beautiful choreography, amazing sound work, and yeah, you know there there are chases on foot and in vehicles, physical fights. Lightsaber duels, martial arts, lightsabers used against not ones not wielding lightsabers, shooting, including shooting while in vehicles. Yeah, the the action is legitimately quite well made. That that's the thing. Like the technical aspects are the the most well handled. The ones where they really spent a lot of time and made sure to get everything exactly right where the, the action, uh, non-action, I mean, the non-action scenes, George Lucas did not sp spend enough time on getting good performances. So the music, once again, handled by John Williams, and yeah this movie actually has some of the best star wars music there's this new one called 
I believe it's called Duel of the Fates or something like that. And yeah, it's it's absolutely incredible. I'm I'm pretty sure it's impossible to forget it. Like you could you could start humming it to someone who hasn't watched the movie like since it first came out. So 22 years and they I I'm pretty sure they would almost immediately pick up what you know what you were humming and they would hum along. And the sound design is also still excellent. Creatures, vehicles, equipment, everything sounds like it belongs in the Star Wars universe. So the comedy there's some slapstick, including some that George Lucas has specifically said was inspired by Buster Keaton, other silly stuff. And as silly and gross as some of the comedy and other stuff could get in the original trilogy, at least they were never, you know, toilet humor, and this has two. And... So the, yeah, the pacing, in part due to the special effects limitations and such, there was not that much Jedi action in the original trilogy, where by the time they made this, there were no longer those limitations, and because of that, there's a lot more of it here. I don't think there's too much Jedi action in this, but I would say there is in Episodes 2 and 3, and, you know, the the original trilogy films had some build-up before, before we saw Jedi stuff, which worked well. This one has it from, really, from right away. Like, I I guess I won't say how many minutes in, from, but, like, from extremely early in this movie, you have Jedi action. And I think, I, I don't think it does get to be too much, but I could understand, I, I think some others would disagree. Now, let's see. So the movie is... Yeah, the, the Disney Plus version is 2 hours and 10 minutes without end credits and 2, two hours 16 and a half minutes with them. And the DVD is 2 hours 4 and a half minutes without end credits and 2 hours 10 minutes and 43 seconds with them. And, you know, if you're not interested 30 minutes in, the movie probably isn't your kind of thing. Right, so... A fellow critic said, What I can't comprehend is why the political details had to be so tedious and abstract. Will the kids of our nation and the world truly be titillated by trade wars and the spectacle of a do-nothing Senate? And I would have to agree. And and abstract is especially... Um, it, it would... It wouldn't be very difficult to make it less tedious. I'm, I'm going to focus more on how you could make it less abstract, though. It would have been easy to have something more tangible, political assassinations, for example, which does appear in later parts of the prequel trilogy, or simply start the movie and the opening crawl with the invasion that happens just a tiny bit later. And, you know, it the invasion starts very early in the movie, so just have that be the start of the movie. If you very badly want to make the point that it started over a trade dispute, why not simply have someone state that the way that in A New Hope, I, I forget exactly who would it, I, I think it might be Vader, and you know we do pay attention when he talks, but, or it, actually it might be one of the, the officers, but you know, someone says, the Emperor is doing away with the Senate, that's not an exact quote, but that's the, the gist of it, you know, just have someone say, can you believe this started over a trade dispute? Just, that's all, you don't, you know, both are interesting political commentary on fascism, but in A New Hope, it doesn't mean that the movie has a boring opening and central conceit. Maybe that needs a little elaboration. The idea of using a trade dispute to justify an invasion. The fascists will sometimes claim that the reason they're sending in military forces is 
to say protect a minority that is facing discrimination or even violence or they'll say that the invasion is necessary because they need to expand their country their people don't have enough living space rather than come out and say the truth that they're doing it because they want to because it'll mean more power for them also no movie in the original trilogy just stops for a long time and this one does multiple times in the original trilogy there was always something going on no matter how long would pass without much plot progression like in Empire Strikes Back where we're learning about the force or Han Leia's relationship is playing out and no movie in the original trilogy has boring political scenes and I say that as someone who thinks that there should be politics and a political message in almost every movie ever made I just I really wish the political stuff in this film worked the best element of this movie is seeing Lucas's Star Wars vision powered by late 90s special effects and lightsaber action and yeah I I would say it's if you can sit through it it's worth watching at least once just for that but I wouldn't blame you if you can't sit through it. The worst aspect, it's a tie between the racism, the childish elements, how boring parts of it are. No one will be seated during the extended political debate segment of the movie. And you know, like if you, it'll be less frustrating if you go into the movie knowing that it's there, lower your expectations, but yeah, you, you can't, like, just mute or fast-forward to avoid it. And I do think that these are major problems. And something I saw a lot of others say was a huge problem, was, was their biggest problem, was that it's too different from the original trilogy. And, you know, if you go into the movie knowing that, lowering your expectations, then it's it doesn't sting quite as much but I do think that it is a big deal I was most worried that it simply wouldn't manage that extremely difficult balancing act between the Star Wars style and bringing in new genres to keep it interesting and sadly the movie lived down to my expectations I was most looking forward to the Star Wars style and the movie exceeded my expectations there you know there are more new worlds more alien creatures more you know weapons more technology more ships you know in this one than like the the original trilogy you know they had a lot more limitations you know as far as special effects technology goes and this one they could and did go completely wild with it and yet like I, I'm not sure I would say that any scene is too short to make an impact or any visit to a specific planet or town or, or the like yeah they're they're all substantial you know that is that is something that is sometimes a problem with movies from the late 90s mid to late 90s and early 2000s that like they're they'll want to have so many different different worlds so they can't think of something interesting for all of them. Now, the movie is largely entertaining, or can be largely entertaining to watch, but isn't that emotionally engaging or involving? The trailers do give away too much. I, I guess all of them, even the teaser trailer gives away at least a little bit too much. But if you like the trailer, you're more likely to like the movie than if you don't like the trailer. Some of the covers and posters give away too much, but they do also give a good idea of what the movie is like. So you're more likely to like the movie if you also like cover and or poster. Now, on the tomato meter, this has a 52%, and the audience score is only 
and there are 233 critic reviews, two hundred over 250,000 ratings. Of the 233, 120 are fresh, 113 are rotten. And that does mean that the ultimate score is rotten. I forget exactly where, I think, is it maybe 61? I think 60 is the highest rotten, 61 is the lowest fresh. I think it's somewhere around there at least. And on Metacritic, it has a 51 for critics and 6.1 for users. And when I looked, the last user review was from the 28th of September of this year. Based on 36 Metacritic ratings, 365 user reviews. And on IMDb, it has a 6.5 out of 10. 3,966 user reviews. And the, yeah, the ones voted most useful are mostly positive. The very top one is very honest and fair, but from then on, for a while at least, they're, they, they're rationalizing, it's, it's apologism, it's, yeah. Like, if you like the movie, that's fine, but at least be honest about its weaknesses. There, let's see... Yeah, and the, the IMDb external reviews section has 364. My back. So, let's see. Yeah, so 25%, 25.8% gave this a 7, 20.5 gave it a 6. 14.7 gave it an 8, 10.6 gave it a 5, so, yeah, very average for the, yeah. Now, it doesn't really have violence or gore, you know, the, the only, like, you'll see, there might be for some aliens but otherwise it's almost always obscured or implied you know you see battle droids you know like cut in in you know, cut apart cut in pieces but there's not really any you know they they have some independent thought they have some ai but there's no real indication at least in this movie that they feel pain so, you know, that does make it substantially less, yeah. And that is almost it for the the review itself. If you really badly want to see what happened before episodes four through six, if you really love lightsaber action, then you know I just barely recommend this movie to you, but otherwise. Yeah, like I said, maybe once for the for the Star Wars. Anyway, the DVD has trailers, TV spots. It's, you know, what does that say? About twenty different featurettes, some deleted scenes, a commentary track. Which you know, the the commentary track has George Lucas, Rick McCallum, Ben Burt, Rob Coleman, John Knoll, Dennis Mirren and Scott Squires. If if you are a fan of the movie, I would say the DVD is worth, you know, I mean, maybe not like full price, but if you can get it on sale, it's worth owning if, yeah. And I cannot comment on the Blu-ray or, yeah, I, I simply don't, yeah.
I haven't, I, I don't know about any of the extras on it. On Disney Plus, the movie has almost 17 minutes of deleted scenes. And let's see. Yeah. And at least in some countries, I don't know if it's all Disney Plus does allow you to stream this movie. So I give this five midichlorians out of ten. And that brings us to the thoughts section. There we go. So if you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep them short and relevant, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section of your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast during the disclaimers. Since a lot of it's very standard information, I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section. Once I get into the rest of the video itself. With that said, please do note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. From here on out, spoilers for the movie and episodes 4 through 6. Now, let's see... Yeah, so this is the part where I would get into, am I glad that this is a prequel? And, I mean, I'm close to, you know, because, cause like, I really appreciate that George Lucas felt he already showed how bad fascism could be. In the original trilogy so he wanted here to you know to to help uh, to to get people to to be more aware of the signs of fascism rising since once fascism has a hold of a country it's extremely difficult to you know yeah to, to do very much about it and yeah, he was basically, he figured that if this movie helped, you know, give, show some of the signs of how fascism rises, then, you know, because a lot of, you know, the people who watched the original trilogy, they would already know what it ends with. And so he wanted to show how it starts. And yeah, I, I wish it, it had worked out better. So let's see. yeah, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of well thoughts, some is analysis, some is MST3 riff tracks, and other jokes. Time codes for all the sections on the description box. The section right after this one is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I had before watching. And let's see. Does the movie appear to have empathy for the least likable characters? Now, those would have to be Palpatine and Maul. I mean, not really, no. They're basically both just evil. And they want power. They want to hurt people. They don't care if the only way for them to get power is to destroy lives. Like, yeah, it, do it doesn't really have empathy for them. I... I do think, usually, I, I find that, I think in real life, everybody deserves empathy. I think there are fictional characters that don't deserve empathy. So whenever you, you do tell a fictional story, you have to make the choice, do these characters deserve empathy? And for this one, I do think they made the right choice. I don't think empathy would have, em empathy would have confused the message, I think. Now, let's see that. I think the movie does a good job of not overexposing any threatening, like, the, you know, there are a couple of alien creatures, but you don't spend so long watching them that the, that you get, you know, used to looking at them. And like tension and suspense, it fares 
pretty well. You know, you don't see Darth Maul's full face for so much of the movie that you become used to watching it and it's no longer... I mean, yeah, scary to children. Not scary to adults, but scary to children. And, and not to the point where they can't watch the screen, you know. Because then they've missed the lightsaber climax and that would be criminal. But the to take that away from someone, but the, yeah, I also just very briefly want to say, I've seen people say, you know, oh, the battle droids aren't scary, the, the Jedi so easily cut them down, uh, yeah, Jedi very easily cut pretty much anything down, like, next you're gonna tell me that you don't think blast doors are a big deal because Qui-Gon nearly slices through one of them, like, the climax with, like, I would have to guess, a hundred or more battle droids marching and shooting at Gungans, I've, I find them to be a very intimidating presence, personally. And, yeah, I, I don't, I, I really dislike Jar Jar, but the rest of his species, other than the, the racist depiction, I, I do, you know, they're, they're clearly good warriors they have you know like they, they have these shields that bounce off laser blasts and they have this massive force field that these i forget i think they have a specific name but the the trade federation tanks can't blow a hole through them and yes the you know you can walk through it but that still does substantially limit you know how how yeah it, it helps control the battle. I forget. I, I don't remember who, but I think I saw someone say that the battle on Naboo, the plains of Naboo, is kind of boring. You know, there, there, you'd expect there to be, like, maybe a rock formation or something. And, yeah, I, th I think it was probably because so much of it is, like, animated, and so they just wanted... They didn't want to have to deal with complex geographical stuff in in the background. Uh, yeah. My making jokes in this should not necessarily be taken as me thinking the thing I'm joking about is actually bad. Me wanting to make light of the subject. I seem to find it difficult not to miss the game or analyze everything I watch. And that brings us to... The next section notes taken while watching good detail when the two Jedi see the gas and ignite their lightsabers the pro the protocol droid apologizes just like by I guess not instinct since you know they're a robot but you know what I mean like just automatic like they didn't even say what are you doing or point the saber towards you know they just, they stand up, ignite the lightsabers, and like, sorry, I, I don't know what I did wrong, but I'm sorry. Which is, which is a pretty, you know, that's, that's a, a solid burn on, like, the kind of people who would have, a pro like, a protocol droid is basically like a butler or something. You know, like, in real life, butlers have to say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry, sir, that was definitely my fault. Close the blast doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I can't let you do that. And the line, communications disruption could mean only one thing, invasion. I've seen several people, independently of each other, say that this line makes it sound like they never have any communications problems. I guess those people missed the line directly before it, where they specifically asked, check the generator, you know, to make sure it isn't a problem on their side. Yes, they don't have the answer to that investigation yet, but they're talking about, you know, probably the answer will be that it is not a problem on there. You know, it's not like they started shooting people. They're just like, okay, as soon as we get that answer, it, you know, we, we need to be ready. I think it's very likely that the answer will be that it's not a problem on our end. Yeah. And, you know, again... Nobody's talking about, like, shooting someone or something. They're just saying, 
there's going to be an invasion. We have to be ready for that. Hypothetically, let's say that, I mean, I guess Palpatine is probably on Coruscant when he's, you know, when the message is cut off. So, you know, like, I guess he would, yeah, like, hypothetically, if, if he realized, oh, crap, our generator is, is you know, has gone, I, I better send a ship to, to Naboo to tell them that it's our generator that there's a problem with. So there, it's not that there's an invasion or something, you know, I, I figured that would be, yeah. We'll need a navigator to get through the planet's core. That, that, that's the thing they actually say in the movie. Here's the, the honest version. We'll need comic relief for a movie with this much, this dry content. I have never understood why Jar Jar starts walking to follow the two Jedi before he started saying that he's changed his mind about it being better to die in Gunga City than at the core. You know, like, like even the very first time I watched this, I, I think I liked it the first time, but I was like, why did he start, you know, if you watch it carefully, you know, he, he'll, he's, he's like, okay, so he's standing here. This would be him walking. So he's standing here and he's saying, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to do the voice. I'm not going to quote him directly. I'm definitely not, you know, count, count me out of this one. Better dead here than at the core. Oh, wait, what am I saying? You know, he, he starts walking just like, is it maybe one full second before? I, I guess it's like the animators thought that he was done delivering the line and the, the sound editor disagreed or something, but just, it's always bothered me. Again, it's like one of the, of, on the, on the list of things wrong with Jar Jar Binks, it's like, it's far down on that list. It's like number 102 or something. I had, for, I had completely forgotten that within a few minutes of the movie showing us that the two Jedi and Jar Jar, you know, as, as they sail under the sea, there are two sequences of a monster attacking or about to attack the ship, and then that monster being attacked by a larger monster so that the two Jedi and Jar Jar can get away. Like, did, did the effects people forget that they did the first one? Did they get bored? what like it's just and it's it's completely unnecessary like if you like you couldn't do it with editing now but if they were still doing effects they could just not have the second set of monsters and just like you know there's this bit where like the the power goes out and so they have to fiddle with some wires and then when the power comes back on the light illuminates this monster if it didn't illuminate a monster, they could just sail and that would be it, you know, or just, or if that had to be something, just think of something different, but just, yeah. I mean, really, it, they could have just had that suddenly the ship loses power. I, th I think the idea is that the ship loses power specifically because the first creature bit the, the ship and, and like damaged it, but they could just have it be that they were given a bad ship or something. They're already worried about that kind of thing. The spaceport will not be pleasant. Then why are you bringing Jar Jar? I do really appreciate that Anakin asserts his personhood when, you know, Padme refers to him as a slave. And, you know, she wasn't trying to offend him, but like he really can't stand that and yeah you know when anakin confronts sebulba in hatiz his performance actually isn't half bad maybe he should have been speaking hatiz throughout the movie i die every time you race but mom i love it and it could get them the parts they need if there's one thing nine-year-olds should take away from this movie it's that when their parents try to dissuade them from a hobby they consider dangerous do not listen to them. It will save the day. You will end up becoming a Jedi. So that was obviously a joke. So the kids playing Anakin's friends are apparently like the children of some of George Lucas's famous, famous director friends. 
I completely empathize with wanting to put them in the movie. But give them non-speaking parts, please. They are incredibly unconvincing. One of them has like three lines in the movie, and all three of them, oh my sweet. It's 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 unreal. It's so bad. It's so bad. Padme appears to be the only person who has much patience for Jar Jar. You know, she smiles when they first meet. Actually, I think she's the only person who smiles when they first meet Jar Jar. And she's the one who helps him get out of the pod engine. You know, like C-3PO and R2-D2 just walked away while he's standing there saying, Please help me. I know they're made of metal, but even outer space isn't this cold. I need a midichlorian count. I have here a petition signed by millions of fans saying that you do, in fact, not need that now, if you'll look. That you, in fact, need to not include that in the movie at all. Apparently, one of the other racers has won twice, but we're told that Sebulba always wins. I guess he won in other race oh maybe Sebulba doesn't race every race I guess okay that yeah fair enough I didn't mean to imply that there was anything at all wrong with George Lucas's writing in a Star Wars movie also I have to wonder if these pod racers if all these pod races end with everyone except the winners pod blowing up like I'm, I mean the the you know they make a big thing of you know Anakin you've never won a race you've never even finished well has anyone <laughs> like I don't know maybe this race is unusual but if so the movie doesn't really tell us why I mean we don't we don't okay we don't know what Bunta Eve is I guess it's possible that that's even more like that's an even bigger deal than usual. Maybe it's only every Bunta Eve race. For all we know, Bunta Eve only comes every 10 years or something. I don't know. But still, it seems pretty wild that everyone participates in this sport where, like, you know, tons of these... Anyway, I would just like to point out that when we're told about one specific racer and his record-setting pit droid team... The three pit droids do three stooges shtick. I'm going to get through it. I'm going to get through it. Okay, right before the... The... the um, yeah, right before the race when Anakin speaks Hatis to Sebulba, his performance isn't good either, so I guess it was a fluke the other time. So depending on who you ask, Qui-Gon either always knew that Padme is actually a Madawa, and when he says the, you know, the Queen trusts my judgment, he's actually saying, I guess if you were currently dressed as the Queen, then you could tell me no, but you're not, so you can't. Or he doesn't, and only realizes after she reveals it to the Gungans. But, yeah. It is a cool detail that when they arrive on Coruscant, the planet, you know, since the planet is one big city, you can see lights everywhere on the planet's surface as they approach, the way that you could see water on Earth from space. You know, it's that's, that's kind of a, a cool, yeah. Some people say that the Queen's dresses are too numerous, too intricate. If you look at real dresses and such that royalty worn, you know, yeah, there's a Star Wars twist, including making it at least a little bigger and more intricate, but they're not as outlandish as a lot of people seem to think. It's just that we we in the West aren't used to seeing dresses like that. That doesn't mean that they never existed or don't exist anywhere. Qui-Gon, I heard Master Yoda mention midichlorians. I've been wondering, what are midichlorians? The bane of fans of the original trilogy all over the galaxy. 
I, I like the, you know, it's a good display of manipulation that Senator Palpatine tells the Queen, you know, I'm going to clear things up. We're going to make sure that, I, I don't remember the exact line, but, you know, he says, we're going to, we're going to make sure we get focused. We're, yeah, focused and get to the, yeah, we're going to, we're going to get results. But to the, the Trade Federation Viceroy, he says, I will see to, I will see to it that in the Senate things remain as they are. So he tells, you know, the Emperor tells them the exact opposite of what he told the Queen. So that's, yeah. And that is the thing, like, kids watching this movie for the first time, they don't realize that that's the same person. You know, that's only when they get a little older or when they watch the sequels and such. So when the Queen, the Jedi, and Captain Panaka, I think there might be others, discuss the plan before the climax, it does do a decent job of setting up why the different parts of the climax are important. The Gungan army, the droid control ship, attack, and capturing the Viceroy. I, I do think, you know, they, they say we, we're sending a small force to the droid, battle droid control ship. I wish they just went that tiny step further and said, if we destroy that, all of the battle droids will immediately disable. Because I feel like you only realize that when you see the ship destroyed, you know, like when we see the, the control ship destroyed and then we see all the battle droids collapse, it's like, oh, I guess that caused that. That makes sense. But we didn't know it before then, so we didn't know quite how high the stakes were. And it just, it's that one little, just have them say that. Just because it's a droid control ship doesn't mean that the droids stop working entirely. Like, you know, like I said, I was like, I was a teenager when I watched this the very first time. So I, I don't think I, you know, but like, if you showed this movie to an adult, the first time they might think, oh, if that, if the droid control ship gets destroyed, they can't communicate with the droids and maybe the droids will be demoralized or something you know since they they do have at least a little bit of of independent thought you know the the there's that bit when one of them says wait coruscant that doesn't compute wait you're under arrest you know that's that's clearly not like if if they just had like Okay, it wouldn't be a hive mind. If, if it was like the Borg or something, it would just immediately go to Coruscant. No, you're under arrest. But it, it clearly, yeah, that was that was the mind of like a slightly neurotic individual, not not the the perfect hive mind kind of thing. I'm not sure I realized this detail before, but those massive ships that drop off a lot of battle droids as the battle droids are being placed on the planet. You can actually see them, like, they, they move slight, like, okay, so if the, uh, let's see, yeah, this is, this little thing here, this is a, a battle droid, my arm is the ship, so as it moves through the air, they get, you know, slightly, in, and then when they stop moving, it does this, and then returns to the, you know, that was, that was, actually come to think of it, that might be the, the 2011 version. That might, and, and the DVD version might not have that. I, th I think there's a chance that that, yeah. But it's a, it's a good detail. It makes it feel more real. Something that this movie does better than episodes two and three is that you get a good sense of who's winning the big battle. Uh, you know, the, the big battle between the Gungans and the battle droids clearly both have significant weapons at their disposal, but the battle droids are doing better. Their weapons are more suited for this kind of battle. Uh, you, know, you know, first you just see, okay, they... they the tanks aren't a threat as long as the force field is up. But then a lot of battle droids go through, and, you know, they, they fire, and they, they fire maybe a hundred blasts. And, yeah, a lot of them get do get uh, deflected with the by the shields. But it's much slower. The, the Gungans are much slower to take out very many battle droids. You know, they'll throw those little blue... energy. They'll, they'll throw blue energy spheres and and those disable you know they can disable at least one battle droid each but 
you know, they're, they're much, they're, yeah, they're not as effective. And then when, when it cuts back to that battle later, we see that they managed to destroy at least one of the, the force field generators. And at that point, the tanks can come in, you know, and yeah, they, they pretty much lose. It's possible that I'm reading too much into it, but I have always believed that when 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 Qui Gon and Obi Wan both make this, you know, for for them being Jedi, fairly small jump between two platforms and get to where Darth Maul is standing, you know, you see Darth Maul to just move just like a step or two back to make room for them. I've always thought that he's intentionally letting them jump and land because he wants the fight to continue. You know, he and, and the two of them make the jump because they knew that he would, because he loves hurting people, toying with people more than he loves killing people. You know, because the, the way I see it, like, if they tried to jump, like, what, what would they be able to do if he, like, at that point, the, once once they've jumped, once they're in the air, he lifts the, the saber and starts swinging it around in the air. What are they going to do? They're not going to be able to, you know, they, maybe they'll, they'll, they'll either be cut or they'll fall, but they can't, you know, and, or, or maybe grab on to the ledge and then he can just, you know, just step on their fingers or something, you know, but he, he makes room for them so that the fight can continue because he's enjoying himself. I don't think that it would have made sense for Obi-Wan to try to rush through the force field using the extremely fast running that, you know, we saw the two Jedi display at the start of the movie. If even one of the force fields comes back, either as he's running or as he's occupying the space that it covers, you know, that, yeah, that's, that's it. He gets badly hurt, maybe even killed. And, yeah, you know, near the end we see the battle between the Gungans and the battle droids has gone from them facing off each other to the battle droids having all of the Gungans on the run or at their mercy of their guns surrendering and such. Yes, it is. I am, in fact, not making comments on Anakin in the in the droid control ship. I guess basically the one thing I have to say is it's frustrating that he wins without really, I mean, he's not even trying to, he just, he just, it's on our autopilot and then flies there and he shoots a few of them and then he fires this other thing and then it blows up and it wins, it, you know, it, he wins the day for, for the, yeah. I'm, that's, that's basically all I have to say about that bit. It's a bad bit. We're losing power. We're losing backup power. We're down to mood lighting. I agree that the reason that Obi-Wan is able to leap over Darth Maul and cut him in half is, like we seem to, is because he's moving extremely fast and the movie's just showing it at normal speed. So we can perceive, you know, so it's not, like, if it wasn't shown either at the, the way it is or in slow motion or something, then it would really just be, you know, like, Okay, so this is Maul, and this is this is Obi Wan. <laughs> that would be it. You know, we wouldn't be able to perceive. You know, but instead, it's like, you know, so so the yeah, that was more fun than it should have been. The the yeah, for for me for me to do. I'm I'm not. I don't know if it was necessarily as fun to watch as it was to do, but it it was a lot of fun to do. I do think that it they should have shown it in slow motion and you know have have it move as fast as it actually you know as as it would have to in you know I realize this is a franchise with almost no slow motion. I mean I'm not sure I can think of slow motion other than like the the frame skipping in the cave on Dagobah where Luke faces a vision of Darth Vader that then turns out to have his own face. But I think this would have been a good place to use just a little, at least. 
I like that Qui-Gon actually does the Jedi thing. You know, when the when the force fields comes on, you know, Mole is standing there like pacing back and forth. He's just waiting. He's just a angry. But Qui-Gon, he sits down and closes his eyes. He meditates. But then he loses. Whereas Obi-Wan, he runs in and starts fighting and he's using his anger and he does win the fight. You know, it, it's it's quest it's challenging this idea that you can't win if you use your anger and it's it's interesting for lucas himself to be doing that uh, you know you, you'd almost expect this to be the kind of thing you'd see in like a, a fan film or uh, you know someone like or or like a, a video essay or something you you would not expect but i mean i guess his his opinions on that kind of thing changed, you know, because he did, he, that was his idea for, for episode six. Qui-Gon's defiance, I sense in you. He did tell you that he had nothing more to teach you, Obi-Wan. And that brings us to the final section entitled Notes Taken before watching. Lucas on the commentary track says that he always wanted to go into midichlorians, but there just wasn't room for it in the original trilogy. And he also says that the race was even longer before we trimmed it. I think they maybe added it back in for the 2011. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. It's been a while since I watched the DVD one. This was the first time I could do as big a scene as the pod race, he also says. Anakin and Luke do some of the same things when they're young. I like having these kinds of cyclical events. We now see the Jedi Temple, Jedi Council, stuff that was only hinted at in the original trilogy. The Jar Jar slapstick in the climax is inspired by Buster Keaton. And that's the thing. I, I don't know if, the, if Star Wars... Like, the Star Wars galaxy the the style that you see in the original uh, yeah in in the george lucas directed movies at least it's like a rubber band like you can stretch it and it'll still somehow be intact you won't have compromised it won't but but if you pull it too far it'll eventually snap and i feel like that's what happened i, I don't think you can have I have no issue with Buster Keaton. I'm I'm not personally very familiar with, but I am not above slapstick. That that is not something that I would ever claim. I have laughed my ass off, not quite literally, watching Laurel and Hardy. Like they were my jam. I I this, to this day I can sit down, I can put on some some Laurel and Hardy, and I can laugh till my sides hurt so i'm not i'm not you're not wrong for loving slapstick but i don't think you can put that in star wars and for it to still work as star wars i just i think it's a little bit too far and the the yeah you know i i talked about some of that in in my video on the on return of the jedi as well for the the mafia gangster stuff with uh, with Jabba in that movie, and let's see. Hmm. I think. Yeah, I will. Let's see then. Ah, there was something right around here. Right. Uh, one critic said that the pod race needed more stakes for Anakin. You know, it's it's a big deal for, for Qui-Gon and, and Padme, but, you know, Anakin, he's just, he's helping these strangers. You know, okay, so he knows Qui-Gon is a Jedi. He wants to help the Jedi. 
he he cares about Padme, but you know, Anakin doesn't even know that the pod race, if, if he wins the pod race, he'll be free. He'll no longer be a slave until after the race. And it, it, he would so easily have that in there. You know, it, it's right after he comes home and he's like, I won the race and your freedom. What? And it's just, it would have been so easy to fit that, you know, just have... I, I get that Qui-Gon didn't want to put pressure on... I, I, I don't think he would have felt that that it would have been good for for Anakin to know that, but you know, but the the critic says, you know, well, what if there's a threat of you know, if Anakin loses the race, his mom gets fed to a rancor or something, and you know, I, that's maybe a little bit extreme, but it's a good point. Yeah, he he doesn't really have any personal stakes in the matter. Like hypothetically, we know we when we're watching, you know, for us. It has some stakes because we do want to see him be free, even though you know he'll eventually he'll eventually become Darth Vader. But he's a cute kid. We want to see him free. We don't want to see him be a slave. But imagine if, in the actual movie, like like. No oh, wait, yeah, got off track briefly. What I was going to say was, it, yeah, in the actual movie, like hypoth, like. When Anakin, like, if you could read his mind as Anakin is racing, what is he thinking? He's thinking, I really want to impress this Jedi and this girl I kind of have a crush on. And that's it. That's all there is. You know, this is a life or death situation. And the, you know, like, the, the, yeah, ultimately, oh, okay, maybe he is thinking. Well, no, I mean, he must not be thinking that much about that it could mean that he dies if the race goes badly because surely he values his own life higher than the approval of this Jedi that like basically he kind of expects I mean okay he says I think you're here to free slaves otherwise why would you be here yeah but then doesn't Qui-Gon say no we have a mission so you know like hypothetically if if like, we know that Qui-Gon is freeing him, but, you know, otherwise, it would just be, you know, I won the race. And, and Qui-Gon would be like, thank you. And Padme would be like, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to forget about you. And then they'll leave. And then what? So he risked his life for a pat on the head from two strangers? You know, it just doesn't... Yeah. And I, again, like, the reason, you know, George Lucas likes the idea of the pod race so he cares about it and he makes it important to the characters because of this kind of ridiculous really contrived thing about the bet but why should you know why should Anakin care why should we care especially because the pod race just completely stops the movie dead and we're just watching a sporting event you know like I I get that like like yeah hypothetically Let's say, you know, it's it's an action scene. You should not be able to cut an action scene without it mattering. But nothing actually changes. Like, all it does is prove, oh, you know, even as a kid, Anakin Skywalker, good pilot, strong with the Force. You know, that's that's not really important for us to know as, as a just... And you, you could have shown it in a way that didn't stop the movie. Like, like, let's say, let's say there was no, no pod race, but there's like, yeah, yeah, you know, there's the, the sandstorm. Oh, they got to be careful about the sandstorm. Let's say that one of them got caught out there. And so Anakin runs like, yeah, so, so, you know, they're, they're supposed to make it into the door, into the, you know, the place where they live. And Anakin is standing at the door. And let's say that Qui-Gon was... A little slow so he gets caught in the storm and it's like completely covering him and he's you know it, it could really badly hurt him and Anakin run, runs up no and like moves his hands to either sides and it moves the sandstorm from where Qui-Gon is allowing him to run in and then Anakin releases his hands and the sandstorm goes back to the way it was you know it accomplished you know it, it accomplished the the same basic you know the yeah the thing of him drive yeah him being a good pilot 
we we see the the let's see i guess the pod race is supposed to tell us he's a good pilot before we see it or, or yeah and then we see it even you know yeah we also see it in the climax but we don't need to see him driving or flying a ship before that we could just have you know he's learning how the 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 thing works the you know as they're flying you know the the that guy says oh you're you're a quick study or something like that fast learner something like that and let's see the yeah you know really the the you could essentially remove the pod race you could have it happen off screen you could like it would actually be kind of funny if they had all this build up and then it's like you know yeah, the, the, Qui Gon says to Watto, "I bet he'll, you know, I'm sure he'll win." So you, if, I, I've never watched what is it called, the fandom edit or what, you know, something. It would be kind of funny if someone like took the movie and and edited, and just cut from Qui Gon saying, "I'll bet you my ship," uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. You know, I'm sure that Anakin is gonna win. And Watto says, "Ah, oh, you you bet too much." And then smash cut to to that bit after the race where Watto's like, "I can't believe I lost." You know, again, that's not verbatim, but he is like, "Yeah, he says something like that was not a fair bet." You know, some it it would be kind of funny if all all that build up and then we don't even see it. But yeah, like it's or just have that there's actually it's literally it's a sporting event during a movie, and I'm not. I don't watch very many sports movies, but I would never in a million years say that Rocky should not have the climactic. That's technically also a sporting event. You know, it's not actually life or death, but it's, you know, he has something to prove and he, he really, he's not going to give up that, you know, I've, I, I don't usually watch sports movies, but the original Rocky movie I would point to as proof that if a sports movie is good enough, then someone who doesn't, I, I don't care about sports in real life either. I still love that movie. That is an incredible movie. It, it really nails what it's going for. You know, it, it like I've heard some, you know, there's that, that college humor sketch where they joke, you know, y'all built it up too much. It was okay. Yeah. If it's, if people build it up like crazy, before the first time you watch it, I I could imagine it's not going to... But if you just watch and just let yourself be transported, it's incredible. Acting, technical aspects, the whole thing. So I'm not saying no sports scenes in any movie. But it's a sports... Like, people are dying. We, we're told, back on Naboo, the people are suffering, some are dying. Others have also pointed out we, we probably should see at least a little bit of that because it's not enough to just be told that. But And it would be so easy. Think of how easy it would be to just write in a scene of like, you know, you could have like, yeah, if you want to go for the, like the fascist thing, like have, let's see, the, the yeah, some, a battle droid walks up to the, the Federation Viceroy and he's like, they were, let's see, they, they, they they stole food from the the well let's see it wouldn't be the barracks because all the they're all robots oh maybe maybe the the you know we yeah they they stole batteries from the barracks and then one of them is like we need those batteries to power the the you know yeah to power our homes and and one of them has like you know may, yeah you know, my, my grandfather is on life support. Without batteries, he dies. And and the Trade Federation Viceroy just says he will he will die for the cause. Captain, ex execute them all. You know, some something like that. Then you you know really nailing home the the fascist. You know, but no, it's just we're just told and then. Yeah, in the middle of all this, this death and all this, you know, well, let's sit down. For, I, I realize it's not a huge part. It's not a, a huge chunk of their lives, but like, I forget exactly how long the scene is, but 
I, I'm, I'm not saying it's like it's not like 10% or some huge amount, but it's a it's a scene of several minutes and nothing else can happen during that. Like we have to just wait for the sporting event to to go through and yeah, you know, it it's just certainly we didn't need to be shown it in real time. They could have just shown like a a couple of really quick yeah, like like maybe a montage, just a few quick clips and then move on. And the critic also said that Qui-Gon discovering Anakin wanting to train him is fine, but it would have been stronger if it was Obi-Wan instead of Qui-Gon. Then they'd have more of a relationship, because as it is, you know, Anakin and Obi-Wan, they get a relationship in the next movie, and they have one in the third also. But in this movie, they, like, the first time An the first time Obi-Wan becomes aware that Anakin exists, he's like, did you... Yeah, never mind. Did you just... I, what was it? I have a feeling we just took on another pathetic life form. It's like, dude, holy crap! And and yeah, that's the yeah. Let's see the yeah. Another critic said Anakin is too young, so he can't have a healthy, deep relationship with any of the adult characters. The political stuff should have been split up by more interesting scenes. And there's also... Uh, yeah. um, I think that might be more or less... Right, I I quite like, you know, the the senator, Senator Palpatine says, begin landing your troops, and the the vice versa says, my lord, is that legal? I will make it legal. Fascism summed up. Now, in my in the review itself, I mentioned Padme Amidala's resemblance to Leia. Now I'll get into spoilers about the character. When we first saw Leia, she was already taking part in dangerous rebel activities, so we immediately see her as defined by being willing to endanger herself for other people. When we first see Amidala, she's decked out like a queen in the middle of queen stuff. She's reacting to the pre-war activities taken by the Trade Federation, so immediately we are thinking of her as royalty. Now. I'm one of many people who do not think royal families are great just because they're royal families. I'm willing to respect them, but they have to earn that respect. And for those who care, to, you know, about the following, yes, my country does have a royal family. Some people get really bent out of shape when people from countries that do not have royal families criticize royal families. I think everyone's loathe to criticize royalty. It's not the Dark Ages anymore, people. The family we're born into is not enough for me to respect someone. But the rest of the movie demonstrates she does deserve respect. Unlike entirely too many members of royalty throughout history, she clearly cares about the people that she's royalty to. She has a strong moral censor. She wants to know more about the world so she can be, be a better queen. And if the situation calls for her, she is willing to engage in military action personally, not only sending out others out to die for her, much less just to die for her ego. It's also, it's expressed really well in the, currently here on YouTube TV spot, One Will, which is also on the DVD. And, let's see. Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if she personally knows any farmers, but I, I think she would care about them more than just officially. The, so yeah, I already mentioned the pod racing scene doesn't need to be in the film. It's there in part to sell the licensed games, the the li game, the one the licensed the the pod racing game, which isn't even that good. Like, I I played it a bunch, you know. I, I that's the thing. Like licensed games usually have problems, and licensed racing games I found are actually some of the most hard hit. Like, I can enjoy a good racing game, but like. The pod racing game, the micro machines racing game, the the 
I am so old. You see, kids, micro machines. Anyway, yeah, the the yeah, the micro machines game from some sometime in the nineties. I I don't I couldn't tell you exactly when. Just yeah. Lego Racers, yeah. I've I've played other racing games that are much much better. Anyway, yeah. I do enjoy the main licensed game of the this movie. It was released for PS One and PC. It's definitely got a lot of problems, but I do enjoy it. Now. Watto doesn't take Republic credits. I've seen a number of people say, well, that doesn't make any sense. I think it does make sense. If the money isn't used in that region, you know, I mean, it wouldn't make, if if he didn't accept trading goods, then I'd agree, like, how does this guy run a business? He won't take money and he won't trade. But they, I mean, they specifically say the Senate doesn't have, do, doesn't have to, you know, doesn't deal with this planet at all. Well, on the planets that the Senate does deal with, Republic credits can be traded. But if it's a planet that doesn't, like, yeah, I, I don't, let's see, is there, is there a good kind of, like, if, yeah, if you were, if you were, I mean, if you if you travel between countries there's a lot of local stores that aren't going to sell like if you're if you're in let's see if you're not in a european country and you try to use euros you might not find a lot of people willing to sell stuff in response to that let's see dollars yeah dollars like if you were in uh, scandinavia like maybe if you go to a bank you could have them traded but if you try to buy something like at a store with dollars, uh, let me well let me think. Okay, Amer U.S. dollars would maybe be accepted, but yeah, I I I don't know. I don't know why people have such a hard time believing. I there's plenty to criticize in this movie. I I really don't think you know that. Yeah, I don't think that one is one of those things. Now, the, yeah, so the Space Battle Climax is too similar to the Death Star, and, you know, in A New Hope, the Death Star is established right away as dangerous, something like you guys need to stop. The Death Star-looking thing here, the droid control ship or station, it, you know, it was like, yeah, I'm not even, was it the base? Was that where the Viceroy was before he went down on Naboo? Yeah, I'm not even sure, because because at the start of the movie, you see, like, ten different things in there. I don't even know if it was the main one or not. Anyway, you know, yeah, there's no Death Star beam aimed at the planet. Don't get me wrong, Anakin saved lives by blowing up base, but it felt derivative and the cuteness is obnoxious. I'm not hating on Jake, I'm hating on George's decisions. Yeah, like, it wasn't... I'm not in a new hope. I don't think it was his idea for the Death Star being, you know, someone else thought of that and added it at the last minute. So now that that person wasn't there suggesting that to George, yeah, it's just like it 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 shortens that other battle. But I mean, if they get to the Viceroy, they can force him to stop the. I mean, I get why it's, like, something that is a big deal in the climax is the battle between, you know, when, when yeah, when Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan are fighting Maul. That's a big deal. Like, let's hypothetically say, you know, oh, they capture the Viceroy, and they're like, you know, okay, uh, communicator, uh, Maul, don't kill the Jedi. Maul isn't going to care about that. <laughs> like... You know, he's he's not going to, oh, fair enough, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to put my lightsaber away. Mea culpa. No, that's, you know, but hypothetically, like, I f yeah, I, f I feel like 
it it's if the viceroy if 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 Anakin hadn't blown up the the thing, couldn't they just have forced the viceroy to use the radio? Because they're robots, you know. They don't. They're not gonna decide. No, 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 I don't care. We're gonna keep fighting. They're they're gonna follow orders. You know. They are. It, it's one of the three. I want to say rules. God, it's been way too long since I read some Asimov. Now, laws. That's it. Three laws of robotics. I'm pretty sure that's what they're called. Yeah. Why did anyone bring Anakin to Naboo when they knew there was going to be fighting? Like, just leave him on Coruscant. You cannot possibly convince me. There is not a single individual or institution in all of Coruscant that you can't trust with a nine-year-old boy that would be better for him, safer for him than an active war zone. Like... It's not like they sneezed and suddenly, oh, Anakin, what are you doing here? No, it's just they bring him there actively. That's the decision that they make. And then he's like, you know, stay where you are. He, he, okay, fair enough. Qui-Gon shouldn't need to say to Anakin, don't get in a cockpit. Don't fly out of here. Anakin shouldn't have... But it's still, like, don't just don't bring him near... You know, he brings him to an active war zone. Then he's like, okay... Go for go for cover over there so that nobody shoots you. You know, yeah. Ultimately, it's not a huge problem, but I don't know a single person who realized on the first viewing of this film that the things Sebulba messed up on Anakin's pod didn't cause the first problem, only the second one. We just kind of assume that you know what Sebulba does, and then the first problem he encounters is the same thing. You know the. Every person I've shown this movie to. What can I say? At the time, when I showed it to them, I thought it was a good movie. I didn't mean to inflict this on someone else, but... Each time I showed this to a person, they were like, Oh, that was what Sebulba broke. I thought it was the first thing. Now, the climax intercuts several different situations, similar to Return of the Jedi, and I do think that works out fairly well. I've seen some say that they don't care about, you know, they, yeah, they don't care about the battle involving the Gungans, or they actively hope that the Trade Federation battle droids win. I don't feel that way. Now, the lightsaber battle at the end looks cool, but it is emotionally empty, except for the third part of it, where everyone is driven by anger. Obi-Wan, not everyone. I voice type these notes. I don't always proofread. Obi-Wan is driven by anger to destroy Darth Maul, but otherwise these characters don't have any connection to each other. It's the first time that's the case of a Star Wars movie. In the original trilogy, if two people both had lightsabers and went up against each other, there was an emotional connection between them. And there could have been in this just, you know, do some light rewriting. Instead of the Emperor being the person communicating with the Trade Federation and the holograms, it could have been Maul. Have Qui-Gon sense something when they land on Tatooine, then as they're flying away from there, Maul shows up. Have him realize that's who he sensed. That's, you know. And as they fly off, have Maul say, it's just a matter of time before I catch you and destroy you. Done. Movie's a lot better. If you watch the various movie reaction videos on YouTube, you'll find that several people had exactly the reaction that George hoped for. They get nostalgic whenever they see a character that was in the original trilogy, especially when we see them, we see some of these characters meet each other for the very first time. And clearly, George believed that all he really had to do was have these characters meet each other for the very first time. He didn't make these be memorable introductions. Like, Imagine if the first time Anakin and Obi-Wan met, Anakin used his piloting or for you know latent force powers to save someone. Now Darth Maul stabs Qui-Gon, who's like, Obi, Obi. So in the scene in the Senate with the massive debate, we see countless different Star Wars planets represented. Including the ones sometimes 
offensively referred to as the Swamp Planet. No, contrary to rumor, I am not myself from this planet. I'm just saying there are a lot of negative stereotypes about us. I mean them. No is not represented by a frog emperor. He was democratically elected. And I believe that covers... Yeah, if you knew anything about me, you know I had to reference that. Just, yeah. Love me some vintage college humor. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for the watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing thoughts, spoiler thoughts, on a movie. And recently, the, these videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I'll catch you next time.